realm of uh, AI. Uh, today we're going to discuss, uh, or the, the goal of today's conference is actually to provide some uh, practical examples, practical illustrations of uh, personal AI agents. Uh, the near future that is going to uh, be surrounding us and uh, today we're going to actually talk with different people. Uh, in the first panel we have guests who are working on practical projects building personal AI agents. In the second, second panel uh, we'll talk with uh, some of the leading experts in Lithuania and abroad on some legal ethical questions in terms of uh, frameworks, governance frameworks, ethical questions that need to be answered in order to bring those personal AI agents uh, into our real world. And in the final panel, I'm quite excited <laughs> to introduce you to our special guest who will join us from South Africa Live. And we will have this interdisciplinary conversation uh, trying to push the boundary uh, beyond legal questions, beyond the practical questions, and think about forgotten or unmentioned, unspoken topics. So in this opening uh, talk, I would like to invite our vice director of Vilnius University uh, to say a few welcoming words. Um, dear conference, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is really my privilege to warmly welcome you to this conference organized by Vilnius uh, University and Gakushuin uh, University in Kyoto, which was made possible by the Moonshot Project, funded by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, uh, Science and Technology, uh, uh, called MEXT in, of Japan. Uh, the conference, uh, the, the project called the realization of a society where humans can be free from limitations of body, brain, space and time. Uh, the complex uh, goals of the research project address developments of uh, cybernetic uh, avatar technologies and infrastructure, as well as augmentation of cybernetic avatar life. Eighteen Japanese universities participate in the project together with foreign partners, and we are happy that Vilnius University was one of those partners invited to join the research team. This conference uh, brings together scholars and professionals uh, with the aim to stimulate discussion about the importance of AI assistance uh, for various areas of our lives, including education, creativity, healthcare, public services, and examine social, economic, and legal challenges to be solved globally. We are proud of Vilnius University achievements in the field of artificial intelligence led by distinguished uh, researchers in biotechnology, IT, and mathematics. However, uh, we are well aware that explosion of usage of digital intelligence tools and devices challenges almost all spheres of social life and requires a far more interdisciplinary access to tackle technological advance. Legal regulation of the AI usage goes hand in hand with AI development, uh, and that is the special focus of this conference. The research group, led by uh, Professor uh, Shoichiro Kozuko uh, from uh, Gakushin University, works on the guidelines of legal regulation of cybernetic avatars globally. It is my honor to welcome Professor Kozuka at this uh, gathering and express my deepest appreciation for, this con uh, for, for his contribution to cooperation with uh, the scholars from Vilnius University Faculty of Law in this project. Last but not least, it is encouraging to have uh, diverse professionals, uh, professional communities represented here, which notably uh, contributes to interdisciplinarity of this event. I wish, I wish the conference all the success, but also like to wish uh, to maintain a cooperational attitude to cope with the challenges uh, we as society are facing. So enjoy the conference and the city of Vilnius, as well as, well as Vilnius University. Thank you very much indeed.
And uh, now uh, we would like also uh, to hear a welcome word from our uh, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Law, uh, Professor Vigita Webreite. Dear colleagues, I would really, in the name of Vilnius University Faculty of Law, would like to welcome you to this conference and to Vilnius University, because I know that for some of you it's the first time in Vilnius and the first time at Vilnius University. I think this conference is really a good opportunity to show that these old halls of Vilnius University, old campus of Vilnius University, could be a place where really new, modern, future things are discussed and. Uh, and new ideas are uh, researched and discussed. So, Vilnius University Faculty of Law really is happy to have this conference to, because our aim is really internationalization and interdisciplinary research and studies. So, it's really this topic is really a good one to show that we are really trying to be interdisciplinary, that not only lawyers speak only about law, but really about interdisciplinary things which are interesting for not only lawyers, and also, of course, really international conference, colleagues from Japan, thank you very much for all your cooperation, and, uh, and other colleagues from different countries, not only in Europe, but seeing broadly the world, are participating in this conference. So I wish you very good conference, new ideas, and I hope that this is only a first conference about these topics, and we will have new research uh, ideas, new conferences, and it will be only a first step in this topic. As actually I, I was driving here, I was talking with my mother, and I said I'm going to a conference, and she said, what topic? I said about AI agents, about avatars, and she said, do you really have such topic at our, your law faculty? I only thought that you, only people in Silicon Valley discusses it, discuss it, so it's really, I think, a good opportunity to show that Vilnius University is really a modern one, and is not, uh, and uh, can only can discuss things also about history, philosophy, but also about new things and new ideas in the world. So good luck, everyone, and I hope you have a really good conference. And I think you have a nice time in Vilnius because really spring feels spring in Lithuania. So I think you will see Vilnius, and you will have a good time at our university and in our capital. So good luck, everyone. So, as a fun fact, I would like to proudly mention that we actually have guests for, uh, from uh, four continents today. Some guests are arriving from Japan, Professor Kozuka. Uh, we have guests who is coming from Sydney in Australia. We also have a, a live streaming conversation with uh, our special guest uh, from South Africa. And we are also having a special <laughs> conversation with uh, friends from uh, California, San Francisco, and uh, LA. So let's have a first uh, uh, presentation uh, delivered by Professor Kozuka, who also kindly invited us, Vilnius University, to join his project and join his team. And uh, as uh, Vice Rector mentioned, there are 18 universities, universities in Japan exploring this new topic of cybernetic avatars. So Professor Kozuka is actually working on one group out of those 18 different uh, research uh, areas. And his goal is to identify what are the legal challenges, uh, what are the problems that we need to actually even identify before trying to develop rules that could help us uh, uh, figure out the position of cybernetic avatars, personal AI assistants, agents. So in this opening talk, I would really like to warmly welcome Professor Kozuka, and uh, we are excited to hear what is the objective of this research. So please. Oh, acrobat has a new look. No, 
There's <laughs> no need to go through the introduction. Okay, uh, thank you very much for a kind introduction and I thank you very much for, for the kind words of opening this a, a symposium by the vice rector and also vice dean uh, of the university. Um, well, and I, I, it is my pleasure to, to come to Lithuania, come to Vilnius, and I, I, to see I, all of you here. Uh, it's my first time here, and I, I, I'm really enjoying I, my I, time I, I, here. Well, and I, I, as I, Professor Yurchis, I, I Paul uh, mentioned, and I, 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 I am uh, a, a leading a team within a very big project. I, I'm going to introduce that to you and uh, to explain how and why I have come here and what I am aiming at. Okay. Okay, so and as already a vice rector mentioned, and a, there is a, a Japanese government a, a, a scientific project, moonshot project, and a, a, which is a, a, which aims at a, a facilitating the development of the cutting the edge technologies. So in most uh, a, 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 most of the, the projects are, are focused on the engineering and a, a, a scientific or uh, medical things. But the, uh, then, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the social aspects, legal or ethical or economic aspects, uh, cannot escape being a, a explored. Otherwise, a technology will uh, a, 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 a kind of proceed without uh, constraints and a, a, a appropriate disciplines uh, by the society. So that has an, a, a led to creating one team, uh, one one group, sorry, and a, a focusing on a, these a legal, economic, and also environmental or sustainability aspect, a, as well as legal and a, a, a aspect a, of the a, a, of, of the uh, the technologies. So, and a, a, that is the group that I am joining, and a, a, that is a, 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 for, a, which has made this symposium possible. Well, and a, a, so a, a few words about the, the technological uh, uh, part of this project, and it is called uh, the realization of a society to use cybernetic avatars. Uh, you may be wondering what cybernetic avatars are, and actually uh, these seem to be kind of a created word, and I heard that the project leadership uh, registered it as a trademark. Uh, I don't know how to make use of, uh, ma make money from that. <laughs> But anyway, and a, so cybernetic avatar is kind of an, a, a technological devices, any type of technological devices to enhance or expand uh, the capability of human beings. And uh, of course, as Paul uh, correctly and I connected this uh, subject to today's subject, uh, most of these devices may uh, be uh, 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 complemented by AI, uh, so that and it will really uh, enhance and enrich uh, the, the life of a human being. So. And uh, uh, then and, uh, there is this group uh, looking into the, the social aspect of the, uh, of the project. And uh, uh, this website uh, is the entrance to, uh, to the research on the, the legal and social aspects of avatars, including the security issues and certification issues. And a, a, there are a few a group, a teams a, a, um, a under this umbrella. I am leading one of the team, and you see here and a, a, the great name of a, 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 a uh, yes, a Paulus Yurchis. And a, I, I have to put a, a photo here uh, so that everyone can identify you. Uh, and at this moment, it is only a logo of our uh, team. So, okay. Uh, that being said, so I, I will now introduce you to the world of avatars. And actually, actually, uh, there are various types of uh, uh, devices or mechanisms, uh, technological mechanisms that, uh, that can be uh, uh, conceived of. 
uh, some of these avatars are truly virtual, entirely virtual. So you may wish to go into, say, an, a, a virtual world a, a, a offered by Meta, uh, a, 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 which uh, some people call Metaverse, or uh, maybe uh, some other uh, virtual worlds are based on the blockchain. And then uh, you appear there under the avatars or, or figures, uh, digital figures of a person. Or even you don't have to be a person. Uh, you can appear uh, under the figures of an animal or a dragon or a, anything else. So that is one possibility. Then another possibility is a, a robot and a, 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 with the enhancement of the, its a ability by the AIs. Uh, so you see uh, this photo uh, is actually used in a, one of the cafes uh, in Tokyo, in downtown Tokyo. And a, a robot, uh, this robot is placed on the table and a, a, the robot takes a, a orders from us. Uh, there are operators, uh, of course, uh, remotely operating this robot, and th most of those operators are handicapped people, either physically or mentally, so uh, these operators do not wish to uh, a, a, a come to work in the cafe, but they are happy remotely operating the, these robots, and they are very proud of their uh, work. So this is how avatar, or this is how personal AI works. So uh, not only, not only it, it enlarges your ca physical capability, but also it gives people, some people, unfortunately, and a, a not a, in a very happy situation, uh, the real pride a, to live in the society. So that is really important to, uh, a, a, for our society to be inclusive of all those people and a, 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 a participate in, a, in the society and work with their pride. So and a, a, that is a one, a, a, a another uh, example of avatars. Uh, there are still a other uh, types of a, a mechanisms. Uh, for example, a, one of the, the airline companies of Japan, ANA, a, is a testing, uh, maybe, maybe introduced in, in the real life, uh, real life business or okay, opportunities in the future, uh, testing a avatar, as they call it. It's actually a screen uh, with a, a, a supporting pole. And a, a, on the screen, uh, you see the face of the real uh, a ground staff. Uh, the point is that uh, depending on uh, which language the passenger uh, talks, uh, whether it be it Chinese or be it, say, a, 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 a Spanish or be it, say, an and a Zuru, uh, then and a, a, a ground staff a located a somewhere in the world uh, could appear through this screen a, to help that passenger and get on board a, the a, a, a aircraft very smoothly. So that is another uh, kind of a device to, to a, a make our life better and to connect a people uh, easily all, all over the globe. Okay. So this is how uh, people uh, develop the technologies. Then, what about law? What are lawyers doing? Well, and a, a, if you are uh, familiar with the developments of the law in Europe and a, a, a globally, especially a, in relation to international organizations, uh, such as a, a United Nations Com Committee on uh, the, the International Trade Law, or UNIDRAW, uh, which is a, 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 an older organization a focused on uniform, unification and harmonization of law. And a, a, so these a, organizations have developed uh, several uh, instruments uh, with regard to the use of these technologies. Uh, like, for, uh, for example, Anstros Modulo on identity management and trust services, which is very similar to the European Union's uh, instrument on the subject, or uh, a, 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 a digital asset a project a, a producing the principles on digital asset and private law, 
I also on a private organization such as a American Law Institute, European Law Institute, or even some a, 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 a lawmakers in some jurisdictions like the U U United States and a, a NQZ or uh, English a Law Commission are working on the law, uh, uh, the law on digital assets. But looking at uh, the other corner of this a, a figure, uh, law on digital persons or virtual persons uh, or a, a digital, uh, I would say, a subjects operated by people uh, like the robots in the, in the cafe in Tokyo. This area is rather unexplored and underdeveloped, I, I, I must say. So this is, I, I think, a, a, the subject that lawyers are invited to work on and find a, a appropriate framework. Okay, so uh, as, uh, uh, this is as, uh, what I already mentioned, so on the law of property, uh, that its digital uh, development is already studied and, uh, uh, by in a internationally and uh, nationally and by lawmakers as well as judges, but and, uh, uh, the other uh, as, oh, the other aspect uh, of the, uh, uh, the other element of, uh, uh, of the private law uh, stands uh, still to be e e explored. And well, I am from Japan, and the Japanese law is kind of a mixture of German and French system, but uh, a Japanese civil code is a pandectin system. So, and I, I based on the Ger German uh, legal family. I, I understand and, uh, the law uh, in the eastern uh, half of the Europe is almost a, a, a similar, uh, if not identical. So, I, I try to say, a, okay, so and, uh, there are persons and there are things. Persons are the subjects of legal transactions. Things are objects of the legal persons. These are the kind of the fi founding a concept of the whole system of private law. And of course, of course, there are French legal family and also common law and American legal family. Still, and a, a, these basic two concepts uh, are more or less similar. So, and I, in none of these jurisdictions, I, I think that uh, they never confuse say, a, or mix up, say, persons and things. But, and as the digital technology develops, both concepts start to be kind of an, a, 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 a blurred and uh, become vague and a, a, a try to escape the existing legal rules. I should, I should be careful about that. Uh, well, and, uh, in, fact, in fact, the law on digital or virtual personality uh, has not entirely escaped the, 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 the examination by lawyers. As in this uh, case uh, of uh, decided by Tokyo District Court, uh, which, is, which is a defamation case. It, it was a defamation case, and bad words were cast against a virtual figure. This virtual figure was very popular and very famous on YouTube, and never a, a physical person a behind it appeared before the audience. So people uh, only identified this uh, figure as a virtual person. Of course, the name was also uh, kind of a pseudonym, and I, I, no one knew the true name of the uh, person working, uh, operating behind. But of course, of course, there was a real person a, 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 a speaking as if a, that person were the figure. Of course, the voice may have been technically changed, but and there was a person there doing so, and maybe that person and he moved their hands or legs uh, so that the di digital uh, virtual figure reflected those movements. And then, as I said, bad words are cast against this virtual figure. So, and it was so bad that and, uh, it seemed to be a kind of damaging the, the, the reputation of the person. And uh, 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 
against the, the uh, litigation raised by that pre a physical person actually operating the virtual figure, uh, the judge in Tokyo District Court said, okay, under certain case, uh, conditions, a virtual world against the uh, bad words against a virtual figure may constitute defamation against the physical person behind. And uh, this case was really like that. So and, uh, considering the situation and considering what was uh, uh, said and uh, uh, the real person behind the virtual figure say, uh, is found to, be, uh, to have been hurt and, and uh, entitled to uh, claim remedies against this defamation. Uh, this is how the judge uh, found. It is good. It is good that the judge found a remedy to the, to the victim of the defamation. But on the other hand, uh, it, say, it shows that, and, uh, a, that the judge uh, treated uh, this a virtual a figure as nothing. It's just like, say, an, a, a, your dress or your mask and a, a worn by you and so that and a, a words about uh, what you wear uh, is really treated as words against you. And a, a, the question is, is that the only approach toward avatars or personal AIs? Uh, as I said, there can be various, a variety of situations uh, and of which uh, and a, 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 these avatars and personal AIs are used. So, there can be possibi a, a possibility to take an, a different approach toward a, these technological existences. Oh. Okay, like this. Uh, well, I, I mentioned that uh, in the case of the cafe in Tokyo, uh, handicapped people actually operated the robots and that was really a, a way to give them a place for living. And uh, uh, there are similar situations uh, with regard to a, an entirely virtual world. And uh, uh, so some of the, the people uh, re are really uh, tired of living in the actual world, and uh, they may hate to see and uh, even friends or family uh, in the real world, but uh, may find it more comfortable and more kind of a, 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 a how can I say it, uh, relieving to be active in the virtual world under the virtual figure without being disclosed of his or her name or identity. Well, there's one Japanese novelist and, uh, who, who uh, writes a very philosophical question. Well, uh, can't we just treat a, such a, a situation as such? Uh, well, uh, of course, the modern society is ba basically based on the Western idea, uh, which is based on a very strong concept of an individual uh, fully equipped with capability and fully equipped with the power to decide on his or her own businesses. But, and uh, uh, that, even in the West, uh, the, even in European societies, reality is that people do not always uh, behave like that. People are not so so strong, and people are not so coherent. In other under under other cultures, in other uh, societies, even more so. Uh, in the case of Japan, which is uh, the society that I am very familiar with, and uh, uh, there, and uh, we are accustomed to say, kind of play a role. Uh, depending on the situation. So I may uh, be kind of a confident law teacher vis-a-vis -vis the student, but maybe more kind of a, a relaxed and say and a, a, a freak of a, some, a, a, a freak of say a history or a freak of say some technology uh, in my private life. So I'm really uh, depending on the situation and depending on the relationship, uh, you change your personality or you switch from one personality to another. That, uh, this uh, Japanese novelist, Keichiro Hirano, called it individualism instead of individualism, uh, which is the basis, a uh, philosophical basis of the modern society. So, there is one 
and a, a, a one person, I would say, uh, who is very famous in the vi virtual world and uh, very active uh, in, a, in cluster or social VR or this a virtual world. And this person says, okay, why not take up this concept and a affirm the independent personality to a virtual identity, virtual figure, a, a different, distinct and different uh, from the, the personality of a physical person behind. So and I, 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 as I mentioned, uh, the Tokyo District Court in that defamation case said, okay, so virtual figure is ju just like a mask and a, a words against a virtual figure is actually an attack on the per person behind. Uh, in some cases that is okay, but in other cases, uh, why not treat the virtual figure as a person independent from a person behind? Okay, good, but uh, then there could be bad people there could be fraudulent people who may say, okay, then we can abuse that system. Uh, we can divide our asset to a, a, a multiple of virtual figures and say, oh, I have no money, so I can't pay off my debt. It's easily what a lawyer can think about. And uh, some of you may be familiar, but in the, in the corporate law theory, at least in, in the US, Germany, and Japan, uh, there is a doctrine of piercing the corporate veil. So something like piercing the virtual veil may also become a possibility. So it's really kind of a serious issue for a, a, a lawyer to think about. Okay, so that is just the beginning. Let's go through uh, several other conceivable issues. Start with uh, this. And I, I, and I must say, in front of the intellectual law uh, specialist, Paul, and uh, that all these and, uh, a, a drawings are, are taken from the, the, the copyright-free and a, a websites, and so they can be used a, a for professional purposes as well. I have checked the terms and conditions <laughs> as a lawyer. Well. Start with the left side. Uh, we have Paralympic Games uh, together with Olympic Games. Uh, in Tokyo, a uh, Paralympic Games, unfortunately, is uh, still uh, uh, in the middle of COVID uh, 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 time, but uh, uh, we, we had it. We see that persons, a uh, person's ability, handicapped people's ability, is. Uh, kind of enhanced or expanded by, a, a, by the use of the devices. Uh, so device can help people do what, uh, more than what uh, that person can do uh, on his or her own body. Okay, but if you do that, if you're not handicapped and uh, still if you do that by taking too much drugs and making a muscle grow, then people say doping, and that sport, sports player is disqualified. So what is the difference? What is the difference? So there must be some kind of regulation or some kind of rules uh, about uh, the extent to which people's physical capability can be enhanced or expanded. Okay. Now, and a, a, when a handicapped person a, runs with a, 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 an artificial leg, uh, no one doubts that that artificial leg is a thing uh, attached to the body of a person. But if these uh, devices are developed and equipped with artificial intelligence and even makes decisions before the physical person uh, with full consciousness makes a decision, are we ready to say that that is still a simply a device or a thing uh, as distinct from a person? Even if that thing makes decisions instead of you. Might be called that at least it is an agent, uh, artificial agent, uh, making decisions on your behalf. 
uh, in that case, uh, a, of course, under our traditional legal theory, an agent is a person a, a working on behalf of you, and a, a person is distinguished from a thing. But if you uh, start talking about an artificial intelligence a, a agent uh, or a digital agent, that means that the distinction between a person and a thing starts to blur. Uh, yes, ah, oh, okay, <laughs> and I, I, I already talked about that. Uh, so we, we, I, it looks like I skipped a one a important issue, and a, 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 the issue to be tackled before that is that uh, if you destroy this device, uh, is it simply a destruction of a thing, uh, or is it more kind of a, a, an injury to your body? That is the, the step uh, that should be examined. And then a to talking about, say, an, a, a virtual or digital agent. And then a, a, we have consumer law. And the, in the consumer law, one of the fashionable topic, a, a, actually back in Japan, I am a, 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 a member of a, 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 a team, a government team, exploring the, the new issues of consumer law, and a, a and that group is discussing uh, the dark patterns. Dark patterns, uh, so digital a, a system that affects a, a person's a, a decision making uh, adversely a, or in favor of the business. So an, a, a digital agent, how is it different from a dark pattern uh, that is accused of and a considered as a consumer law problem. So that is another issue that we need to carefully think about. Uh, then, yes, and a, a, so uh, there is a problem that if uh, that digital uh, uh, agent becomes so autonomous that it makes decisions, even, a, a, the, a, even that a contradicts uh, with the decision of the person using that digital uh, agent. Uh, in that case, so how can you treat, uh, uh, treat uh, uh, how can you deal with this person using the digital avatar, a uh, digital agent? Uh, is it something like, say, a apparent authority? Or is it something like, say, uh, an, a, 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 a corporate director uh, working a beyond the scope of he, 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 his, his or her uh, authority? So and that is a, a, here is another issue that we need to uh, tackle with. So and a, a, I would say that a, a, the generative AI, which is also a very fashionable uh, topic and has been kind of uh, occupying our uh, lawyers discussion since the last few years, uh, so generative AI creates kind of an appearance uh, or as if a real person is doing something. So now avatar or personal AI uh, creates an entity as if uh, there is another independent and a, a figure, independent and a s entity a behaving a distinct from the physical person behind. And also, as I said, and a, a, there, there are the, the, the line between a person and a thing start to sh become shaky and blurred. But in Europe, as well as in Japan, my country, uh, there is this concept of AI should be human-centric. So AI should not be the dictator to uh, control human beings. But if you start blurring the line between a person and a thing, how can you do that? That is a very uh, serious and ultimate question that we need to think about. Of course, a, talking about all these kind of fundamental and uh, basic a, a issues uh, does not mean that there are more uh, kind of a, 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 a 
much more uh, uh, questions uh, closer to the business activities and closer to the practice in the real life. Uh, like, say, uh, privacy and data law issues, like, say, intellectual property issues, like, say, disinformation and uh, fake issues, uh, like, say, uh, protection of consumers and children. And, a, a, of course, a, a conflict law, dis dispute resolution, all these things. And a, a, I, I never forget about them. And a, besides those questions that directly a, a affects the, the fundamental con uh, basic concepts of the private law, we also need to tackle with these issues as well, of course. So, uh, how, can you, how can we proceed? Uh, this is not a big, big uh, event. This is a small event, uh, just a, between uh, Vilnius University and my university, but uh, we have to have a big aim. Uh, big aim is that we need to have a globally acceptable principles, at least. And a, a, one of the reasons why I say this is that I have been working, uh, I, I have been a, a, a correspondent of UNIDROA for uh, almost 30 years. Uh, so, and a, 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 excuse me, not, not 30 years, more than 20 years. And a, I have seen how a, a, a states have collaborated together to develop a globally harmonized or a globally acceptable rules and principles. That is the approach that uh, Euro European tradition, a, a, that roots in European tradition a, a since decades, and that is the approach that Japan and other jurisdictions participated in the meantime. So that may be a, what we need to aim at. I'm not saying that we are going to move politically. Uh, if you want to do so, you can do so. But and I'm not saying a, a politically. But I'm saying just intellectually and academically, uh, we can produce a globally acceptable principles, uh, which may base on a, a, the, the activities of the, the, the states uh, through develop, uh, constructing a better and appropriate digital world. So that this is, I think. Today is the beginning of that process. Thank you very much for your attention. something built into it which uh, sort of influences the user towards mm. the corporate uh, towards the owner the corporate uh, ownership of the algorithm I find this very interesting maybe you could say a few more words yes and uh, that that pattern is a, a, a becoming a big, big problem in various jurisdictions so and the the most uh, the simplest example is that and a, a, on the website a, where you are going to shop, and a, the, there's a pops up a sign saying, oh, this is a, a, a time for sale. And it's just, say, and a, a 100 euro or something. And then a, as you proceed, uh, there are so many conditions coming up. And a, a, when you uh, choose all these options and conditions, it ends up, say, 300 euros instead of a 100 euro that you identified in the beginning. So, and in in that manner, uh, people's process of decision making is affected by the digital mechanism uh, which could be manipulated by the, 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 the operator of that system. Uh, this is a problem and a, a, a having, becoming a, a serious in the consumer law a, a world. But uh, as I said, and a, a, if we a, a, a affirm the concept of digital agents, they affect our decision making. So the only, uh, uh, that means uh, our decision making is manipulated. So only differences, and uh, whether that is a, a, a adverse to us or beneficial to us. But how can you decide what is beneficial to us? So it, that is, uh, there lies a very difficult and maybe philosophical question.
Okay. Okay. Great. So Kozuka Sensei. Okay, so I would like to invite our second group of panelists uh, to sit at the table. This was the only presentation that we had. Our goal of this conference is actually to have a very friendly conversational experience. And from now on, in this uh, next several panels, I would like to really dedicate as much time as possible for conversation with the audience. So at the beginning, at every panel, we ex expect to have uh, some introductory conversation about certain topics, but then if possible, we would like to open up the floor for everyone to raise questions and then really have a conversational experience. Okay, so let's start our uh, second panel. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the panelists uh, to join me at the table. So, Yoko, <laughs> Melanie, <laughs> Gauda, Danielis, <laughs> Marius. <laughs> have uh, 40 minutes of conversations and then I will have a uh, you know discussion after that uh, we will have also coffee break so that you can Thank you for joining. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, Marius, who is uh, one of the prominent uh, venture capital investors here in Lithuania. I also have known him for some time. Based on my experience, I know that Marius has also been in the seat of uh, building companies. He had some success, and now he's on the other side of uh, technology revolution, trying to figure out what are the most uh, prominent, most exciting ideas that are up and coming and uh, support uh, successful founders. Next, I have my uh, great friend, uh, Gauda, who also actually helped a lot in organizing this event. Without Gauda, we would not be here, <laughs> so thank you. And I also would like to congratulate Gauda because she has successfully defended or completed her PhD thesis in uh, this area of uh, artificial intelligence and legal uh, judicial system. So we'll hear about this topic from her. And finally, uh, my colleague Yoko uh, traveled here from Monaco. <laughs> and uh, uh, Yoko is really a humble person, uh, but he has worked uh, his entire life of, on intelligent uh, applications. Uh, some, uh, software, computer systems, he has been actually leading uh, revolutions that have taken in the past. Uh, he is one of the first founders of a company, uh, of social analytics company, which was uh, built and successful just before uh, Facebook even existed. He also was one of the first uh, uh, entrepreneurs building the crowdfunding ecosystem. And now uh, also thinking about uh, personal AI agents, personal AI applications in the realm of healthcare, wellness, and so on. So. Uh, I'm excited to be here with them. So let me change the seat and
Got the butter? Super. Uh, so I would like to uh, begin our conversation. It's really, we are trying to make it casual and friendly conversation so that we can really freely sp speak uh, uh, about this exciting topic. So I would like to begin by asking Goda actually to share her insights and experience uh, doing research in the area of uh, courts and judicial system. And uh, it seems uh, quite surprising even to imagine what kind of uh, AI applications could be feasible in this domain. So Goda, could you uh, shed some light and maybe give some examples about uh, AI applications in this domain? Sure, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so generally to share some insight. Okay, so basically, even though uh, courts seem to be uh, resistant for a long time for a technological change, uh, now the courts are changing, really, with the help of technology. And various assistance are being implemented and used daily worldwide. Um, to, to name just a few examples, maybe I think it would be easier for me uh, if I can uh, try to group all of these uh, agents or these uh, various technologies used. Uh, so, um, uh, actually, Professor Kodzuka put it very nicely when he did his uh, um, uh, this differentiation of different avatars. Um, and what I will try to uh, differentiate uh, these uh, agents from uh, a little different point of view based on the effect that they are creating. So one group would be uh, I will use this. Um, I, will, I do it as well in my thesis, but. Uh, the differentiation that I'm using is actually borrowed. Uh, the wording uh, belongs to uh, Tania Sordin. She's a, a very prominent researcher and actually also, I think, a dean of the um, uh, school of, uh, Newcastle Law School in Australia. And she says that there are three types of um, technolo technologies that are changing uh, courts worldwide. And uh, in this sense, uh, I'm uh, referring to three types of assistance that are changing courts wor worldwide. So the first group is supportive technology. So it means that uh, supportive assistance, they are supporting, it's pretty straightforward. They're supporting the, the users with information, with advice, with information, and so on. So here we can think about some chatbots. I think everybody knows what a chatbot is. And so, and various different apps, also Ask a Lawyer, Do Not Pay App, there are a myriad of different apps that help in, in, in legal field in general and that are implemented in courts. Uh, another group is um, reformative technology or in this case, reformative assistance. So these are the uh, 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 assistants. They are replacing um, tasks that usually would be carried out by, uh, by judges or by um, uh, people that work in courts. Uh, these reformative replacement um, uh, assistants, so some of the examples could be that uh, uh, when we talk about courts, that they, they help to, um, to summarize huge amounts of information, and there are some examples. The latest one that I uh, read in, the, in, in, in court's field was the IBM program called Olga that is used in Germany. So it basically just helps with huge amounts of documents to find, to sort documents um, that it, it is easier for judges to navigate through, through, through those documents. Um, then there are, I don't know, I can talk a lot, <laughs> but I will try to give like a few more examples and then, and, and then if you have more questions, I can answer them. Uh, a few more examples uh, that could be used, uh, uh, that could be presented as assistance are, um, there was this technology that was created back in 2019 that, hel uh, that um, uh, said to predict the outcomes of, um, of uh, European Court of Human Rights with the um, accuracy of 79%. So another similar example was uh, um, another <coughs> assistant was created that uh, is said to be able to predict the uh, results uh, uh, of um, 
the Supreme Court of the United States of uh, America with 70.2% accuracy. Um, also, there is this LexisNexis program. There, there are plenty. Ross Intelligence also helps with the large amounts of data to process this um, large amount of uh, various documents in courts and to reduce the backlog of judges so they can concentrate more on more complex tasks. Then the final group of uh, assistants is um, disruptive assistants. What it means is that they change uh, the way courts work in a sense that they replace uh, humans um, in uh, those uh, where we usually would require human intelligence, to put it simply. So um, there are not many clear examples of these disruptive uh, assistants used worldwide, but um, to think of some, uh, there could be this, uh, I think, this compass um, tool, which could be deemed as assistant which uh, uh, also is being used in the United States of America and some states. Um, so what it does, it is that with the help of um, uh, a con uh, convictant answering a questionnaire, and the program also gathers some information from um, uh, criminal records and to get the answers to these, then there are 137 questions, I think. And then it generates the... Uh, uh, the score, how probable, how, what is the probability of that person convicting, convicting a crime again, and then this outcome is uh, sent to a judge, and then the judge uh, will make uh, makes the final decision. But still, usually they adhere to this uh, to the score generated by by this tool used. Another similar example could be um, uh, same ca uh, same type case reference system. I think it's it, it's called like that, uh, which is uh, deployed in Hanzhou courts in China. So the idea there is that uh, the system not only uh, gathers all the uh, f uh, information, then sets out the most important facts for the case, but it also generates uh, a final not a final, but a decision based on the fact that it summarized independently. And then the judge gets this recommendation and the judge can either um, go with, it, with, that, uh, with that recommendation, with that uh, decision, he can alter it or, or he can reject it. But still, what is groundbreaking is that systems are making uh, decisions, they're making suggestions um, for, 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 for uh, the ones working at the court. So briefly, I think that's it, but go ahead and ask more. Okay, Gada, so I think uh, what uh, we can take away from your introductory presentation is that uh, courts are usually understaffed and they have to handle lots of information, lots of documents. So there are new tools that help uh, applicants, individuals to easily uh, fill in the forms and also help uh, court staff court judges uh, to probably operate and uh, process huge amount of information faster. Uh, now I think uh, it's uh, exciting uh, to shift uh, to Danielus. Uh, as we know, uh, the rollout of uh, ChatGPT caused many waves and discussions, lots of controversies. And surprisingly, <coughs> uh, surprisingly, uh, chatbots like uh, uh, ChatGPT and similar tools um, although they seem to be really powerful and empowering people to n discover new types of interaction with information, uh, the sector of education has been quite resistant. And there are many prominent examples at many leading universities, many publishing houses uh, who force authors or scholars who are writing articles to clearly disclose and uh, make a, almost like an oath type of statements that they have not used uh, large language model tools. It's quite surprising, so I would like to ask uh, Danielus to share his vision. Uh, how can these personal AI teachers uh, and similar types of applications uh, open new opportunities for us? Thank you. It's really fascinating what is happening. Um, 
I've spent the last seven years trying to understand how new technologies like blockchain, metaverse, AI will change ed education. Also built uh, lots of products trying to change it and understood many lessons that the traditional education does not want to change um, at all. Or like uh, the traditional education VCs are financing um, solutions that are fixing the current issues of education system mainly digitalizing processes, which does not necessarily include uh, neither blockchain nor AI nor metaverse. So for the last, let's say, three years, I was focusing more on, let's say, technology native solutions to education. You know, let's disregard the traditional education system and let's look how people could learn right now or in the future um, without these institutions that we relied upon for millennia. And, uh, you know, the, the picture became very clear, you know, taking into account what, what is happening and um, how all of us, I believe, are using ChatGPT or other tools today, um, that the interface is shifting towards uh, interacting with, uh, you know, let's call it AI agent or AI coach in case you're uh, learning. So essentially, you know, we'll see the future where all of us will have one or many personal AI assistants, and this will be our interface to the web and the world. And uh, why does this matter? It matters if that AI assistant can build your own avatar. Essentially, your AI assistant is your confidant. You know, it knows about you more than anyone else you know this is like the perfect surveillance and profiling system so how do we protect ourselves against uh, adversarial actions from you know bad algorithms that might be put in that or um, or even data leakage um, or you know other things uh, other ways uh, those AI assistants could you know affect us and in my um, to my knowledge, you know, blockchains should be the solution for that. Your private blockchains of your personal interactions with the chatbot. But, you know, with the amount of that interactions, with the amount of data between you and your AI assistant, you know, it, it becomes easier for this AI assistant to control you than for you to control uh, the assistant. So essentially, you could outsource the tasks such as, you know, make sure that I exercise. And, and you, if you think you have this AI assistant, you know, in the form of your phone, or now we have those new gadgets that you can just carry around like a, you know, staple it on. And uh, I think in the future, we'll see Neuralink, you know, as well. This will be your personal AI assistant. And this is not as far as people think, you know, maybe it's in a decade. Um, given that the first installations already happened. So then you can actually, you know, rely on the algorithm of your AI assistant to get uh, where you want. And this is, this is very important. It means that you as a user should control the algorithm. And you probably can sway it in a way that, that you would like. You know, you can install the values and virtues of that AI algorithm so that you would be managed by the algorithm in a way that, that you want. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking in general, but thinking about education, education will be radically transformed. And even today, um, I learn ev every day something, you know, new from my interactions with, you know, ChatGPT. If I don't know some, something, you know, first thing I ask ChatGPT. I, I learn much faster than Googling, you know, because when you Google, you need to pass through the results, and here you have it very quickly. And you can do it in a conversational way. So, like, my personal learning has increased probably 100% just because of having this chatbot. Now, what if you could... Um, sorry, but I, I'll just get back a little a bit. Um, you know, in, in education or learning, the most effective way to, to conduct this is to do one-on-one -on -one personal, you know, training, learning uh, sessions. But this is not feasible because of, you know, 
uh, cost of resources. And therefore, we have like one too many formats that we had for centuries. Now we are trying to do blended stuff, you know, where you learn something online, but you still need, uh, you know, personal interactions. So you're trying to reduce the amount of human time, which is costly, in order to spread education uh, fi wider and uh, cheaper. And essentially, this AI chatbot, AI personal assistant, can fully replace uh, you know, uh, human interaction. It can make you accountable. Therefore, you know, the learning as we know it can change dramatically. Instead of having you know, a timed session where right now I will sit for one hour and I will learn something, I can direct my personal learning coach to educate me um, you know, in three months uh, Spanish language. And it can you know, insert learning um, you know, sessions in daily life. For example, you know, um, how is a glass called in Spanish? I don't know. But uh, it, it can tell me, look, you're sitting by the, by the glass. By the way, it's called like this in Spanish. Um, and other things. It can just stream to us whatever knowledge we require. And uh, in essence, we own, we should own the assistant. We should con control the algorithm and instill values. And then it can make us into super humans. And everything that I told you, um, except for Neur Neuralink, is possible today. No, we just need to get into adoption, and adoption is slow. But uh, as always, you know, there are early adopters and laggards. And um, this poses many threats for traditional industries, for universities. Of course, you will never have so, such beautiful halls as this, personally. But, uh, you know, I really, uh, you know, debate the future of buildings in, in education. And uh, we should redefine or rediscover uh, what should be the education system. Thank you, Danielus. I think uh, we have a question already from Yoko, or a comment. Yeah, actually, one of my questions is that uh, I was in another discussion, I think that it was in London, and um, there were comments that education and healthcare are maybe the first areas where AI could really give a lot of value. But one topic that came up is that they are politically very difficult areas. That if, if you have, for example, AI teachers or whatever is the concept, there will be a lot of comments that, that we don't have any more people to teach our, our young people and the machines are taking over this and this is terrible. So that it can be easily also a kind of, could I say, populistic political debate. Have, have you seen something like that? Yeah, definitely. There is a huge pushback even in Lithuania against, you know, AI uh, tools and uh, by very prominent experts. Um, you know, when I talk about education, I, I usually sway towards, uh, you know, adult learning because that's my area and I sometimes ignore, you know, kids' education. But uh, your comment is very re relevant to, ki to kids' education. Uh, you know, Definitely, AI agents will not replace immediately our emotional needs. You know, because as humans, we mirror other people and we mirror emotions, etc. And this is how we learn how to behave in a society. And uh, from from research, uh, we did some research studies with Tartu University of Education Technologies Institute, um, and did some meta analysis. And uh, essentially. Um, uh, self-directed learning or, or basically self-regulated self learning uh, is the skill that ever, everyone should master by the time they become ad adults. And the younger the, uh, you are, the more support from other human you need in order to uh, do, do education. And once you're an adult, you should be able to learn on your own. And by the way, by the way uh, a very, very funny fact is that only 10% of people can learn independently. Everyone else is on a spectrum of support needed, and that support is usually human support, you know, like a teacher, a peer group, or some social 
uh, influence. And we did a research study exactly on this. And you know, uh, we enrolled 100,000 people in online coding school with the best material possible. No one finished. Yet in uh, the, uh, our counterpart, Code Academy in Lithuania group, uh, you know, everyone finished. Out of a group of 20 people, everyone finished. And the, the material was the same, the process was the same, the motivation was the same, yet nobody uh, managed to learn online six months. So we are on a spectrum to connect with somebody. Um, and uh, for kids, definitely it should be a live human being, but with time, I don't know, we'll, we'll see how it progresses. But uh, traditional ed education will, n I, I think it, it will change in a bank rather than, you know, <laughs> uh, slowly. I think there will be some huge crisis, crisis of meaning, crisis of something else, and we'll need to redefine the function of traditional education. Thank you, Danielis. Uh, I will like to show you a, a video clip uh, that Yoko brought with us. It's going to be a one minute uh, illustration of uh, what are uh, some of the possible personal AI agents and applications that can be built by you tomorrow. Profina enabled. Once again. Profina enables each individual to collect all personal data to their Profina account. The user owns that data and has full control over it. We support many data sources with a focus on well-being and health data. For example, you can connect your wearable devices to your Profina account and combine your exercise sleep data from different sources you have. It's possible to build different types of applications and services on top of your Profina account and use the data privately. We've now also implemented an easy tool for anybody to build AI solutions on personal data. We call them AI buddies, and this is how it works. So I'm signed in to my own pre-AI account, and you can see that I've got an AI buddies toggle here. I have three different AI buddies in my own account. I can go into one and you'll notice a button that says add knowledge. I can go in and bring any type of things that I want this AI buddy to know, be it cookbooks, recipes, expert guidance on certain type of exercise, you name it. Upload it in terms of files, or I can use a very simple URL to bookmark websites. We even have simpler tools uh, in the browsers available. Here you can manage the knowledge that your AI buddy has, having full visibility over the content that it knows, as well as the size of that content. So for example, here in my own account, which is linked to my uh, personal data and my Perfina account, I've asked about daily activities. So here it says that I can see your daily activities, you engage in a variety of tasks and routines, work, school commitments, leisure activities, exercise, and so on and so forth. Then I ask it, do you think I get enough exercise? Okay, it knows who I am, it has information on me, it has my wearable data, um, but it's also completely private. It says, your exercise routine appears to be inconsistent. Engage in physical activities, but periods of inactivity, so on and so forth. But this AI buddy, is completely mine and it's completely engaging privately for my own benefit. At Perfina, we provide a full solution. You can collect your personal health and wellness data into one place and you exercise full control over it. Control is important because when you control your own data, you can control your own AI and make sure that it's actually working for you. You can keep these as private as you want you can have various applications that help you in your daily life. Now also, you can have these unique and personal AI buddies that combine your data and some external knowledge for your own benefit and your own value.
So, Yoko, could you uh, explain once again what was this clip about and uh, what's the message here? What we are doing is especially to give con control to people on their own data. And uh, when we talk about AI, uh, of course we often see that AI is a kind of independent party, or as the professor was talking, uh, that uh, is, is, is it, what is the difference between person and thing. But what is very important part of this is actually the data. What is the data behind the AI? Who owns the data? Who can control the data? And um, there are quite a lot of activities in the business that uh, how different businesses can collect data, how they can utilize that in their business, and how they can create AI. But if we think individual people, we are actually in quite early phase that how individuals can uh, control, own, and utilize their own data. Of course, in many cases, like if you use, for example, Google services and, and so on, they have collected some <coughs> data and they can personal, pe personalize the service to you. But in the end, it's always inside Google service. It is part of their data they basically have a rights to use that data. So what we really want to uh, do is empower people with their own data. And our first focus is now especially well-being and health. So that that's why, for example, we, we have done it easy to collect all your wearable data, your exercise data, your sleeping <coughs> data, your health data, to your own personal account and then have basically these AI buddies that are basically working for you. They are working with your data. You can also uh, combine basically some external data and so on. So, so that you really get AI, uh, AI entities that work for you and uh, are also thinking what you want. Not only, for example, uh, if, if you use something in the internet, it's mainly that the company try to optimize how much they can sell to you. Uh, so that, that's, that's basically what we are doing. And one important part of this is also that uh, there will be more and more data all the time. We, we have, for example, these wearable devices today, but there will be much more sensors in the future uh, that are uh, in our body, they are in our footwear, in our clothes. Basically, there will be sensors everywhere. There will be also much more sensors at home. And all these are basically collecting a lot of data. And one very important question is that who owns that data, who can control that data, and who can utilize it so that for whom AI buddies are working. And what we really try to do is empower individuals with their own data. So what I found uh, fascinating from the clip, it seems that uh, in the future, <coughs> probably tomorrow, every individual will be able to be the one who creates their own personal AI assistance, what they want. It's not uh, some big Silicon Valley technology company that provides me an application, but actually as an individual, I should be able to create my own personal AI assistant buddy uh, that works for me and uh, really looks into what are my preferences, what are my desires. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and then they, they are actually, I think that it's interesting how the technical uh, uh, opportunities and the legal aspects are together in this area. And the professor's presentation was very interesting. 
Uh, and then there are even very basic questions like the co copyrights, like who owns my voice, who owns my physical appearance. If somebody makes my avatar with my appearance and with my voice and uh, learning from my behavior, who owns, owns this? And this is important for each individual. Then there are special questions, for example, for some famous people, that actors and so on, who own their copyrights also with their digital assets. So, so that we are really going to see many new situations and I, I, I think that uh, there will be also many uh, quite complex legal questions. At the same time, I feel that uh, that it must go in that way that we basically go step by step and we find solutions for practical questions. At the same time, I think that it's often also so that if the technologies and new solutions enable something, they easily create also a kind of default standards and default uh, solutions, how things are going to be. Thank you, Joko. So, Marius, finally we get you. <laughs> uh, I think uh, when we imagine the work of VC, we think that you have the most exciting role. You get uh, to see all of those startup founders, the most creative people approaching you with their ideas. Uh, from the outsider's perspective, it seems that you probably have the most exciting job. So, could you share your internal perspective into this new emerging domain of personal AI assistance and uh, you know what do you see uh, is happening and I also have another question to you at the same point um, is it different actually when you are evaluating startup pitches uh, from let's say b2b SaaS applications and uh, these really emerging new types of uh, ideas and projects that are testing the waters that have not been tested so how do you approach uh, this, uh, let's say, new generation of uh, technology founders. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to share that. Um, I completely agree here about the data. I, I believe that uh, each of us are in a data business, let's call it this way. You know, the, the VC is not an exceptional part as well. So giving a context maybe from the um, Baltic state, so Overall, the startup ecosystem, VC ecosystem, it's not a very big part, you know, from, from if, if you look from a governmental perspective or country perspective. Um, for example, in the Baltics, we're talking about 3,000 startups, right, uh, active now, about uh, 15 billion market cap. So, so basically, 12 unicorns that are valid more than 1 billion, then, you know, another companies who raised. Of course, revenue-wise, uh, there are completely different numbers, uh, taxes paid completely different numbers, and we're talking about, nobody knows clear, but about 50 to 80,000 people involved, like employees, universities, et cetera, et cetera, in this ecosystem. So from that perspective, it's a bubble. We call it bubble. It's, a, it's a maybe not a big, uh, very big Im impact on a country level and so on, but that's where all the innovations are happening, right? And if we see from, you know, overall global perspective, European perspective as well, you know, Baltics perspective, Lithuanian perspective, we see the same. And uh, absolutely exciting part to be in, the, in all those innovations and, and uh, in the epicenter. I, I completely, like, uh, agree here that we saw the huge wave uh, uh, during the COVID on this ed tech and health tech, med tech startups. And even, you know, after the COVID, it's kind of you know, the wave got down. And with the AI, all those two verticals as well, you know, raising. And, you know, from, from my simple subjective view, uh, the reason is not like uh, technological wise. It's more like people want to live longer and be healthier and be smarter, you know. So that's why there is a lot of, you know, investments in, in, the, in those sectors as well. There is a lot of uh, progress here. So. Yeah, absolutely. Getting back, you know, to, 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 to your question, we're seeing a lot of movement in those AI. Some of them are more like uh, artificially going, whatever business you are building, now you should be more on a trend, on a wave, and to build those AI. That's why you are to a classic software, classic business, just adding those simple generative AI features with the prompts, and you think that you are building AI. That's uh, completely wrong, and from VC perspective, those type of business are not investable because you know even 
like uh, six months ago, 12 months ago, uh, when you are looking from a startup perspective and you want to see the competition, uh, you are doing this due diligence, you're trying to understand what's the competition globally, trying to find those competitors. Now, first of all, when the new startup comes through the investor's radar, you're going to GPT marketplace and actually looking, is there, you know, GPT marketplace uh, simple, uh, not solving this this issue uh, at the moment, and this is happening every day, you know. So, so it's definitely tra transformed the market from the startup perspective. As well, uh, investors and VCs are changing their own process, like dramatically changing. Uh, investors or VC perspective uh, is very simple. You are looking for a good, uh, you know, startups. It's called scouting and screening. Then you seeing, you know, how is a good the deal. Basically, looking for a competition, market size, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then you making a deal. You investing in this, helping the, the startup, and you know, after eight nine years, you are exiting the startup. So if it's successful, so the business model is quite simple, and everything was doing by like human, you know, so. People were deciding are the people good to invest, people were deciding are the market is big enough, people were deciding, you know, is the competition, people were deciding what are going to be next investors, and people were deciding who to sell to the business. Now it's changed. So even, you know, in, this, in, in our business, the AI is very involved in the finding the startups, screening the startups, making some sort of decisions, making math, making calculations, making suggestions, everything is involved. There are many tools for that as well. <coughs> And I completely agree here that this data becomes essential. Uh, those uh, funds, those VCs who are also very data driven and they do have these data uh, assets, data pools, they can actually you know, uh, use the tools for entire the process, make those decisions, who to invest wiser, and, uh, and this is happening. So yeah, data is a big, big thing. I'm curious if there are any insights or questions from the audience. That's where the most exciting part should start. <laughs> I think the first uh, big takeaway, I think, from this panel is that uh, we are always uh, now facing this uh, dilemma of uh, shortage of experts, too much information, and the fact that there is much more data being generated every day. Fun fact. Uh, during the first year uh, since the release of ChatGPT and Midjourney, uh, there were more digital images created during this first year than through the entire human history uh, since the photo camera was invented. It's quite fascinating. I think my question on behalf of you to the panelists is uh, actually about the adoption. Uh, all, so often we hear uh, skeptics uh, talking about personal AI assistants, agents, buddies, confidants as uh, s some kind of huge uh, monster that is either g coming here to destroy the humanity or is going to deliver us a miracle. So trying to balance these two extremes, <laughs> I think we see there are many practical applications uh, where AI agents are already being developed and adopted, but I would like to ask for your insights. How can we accelerate uh, the adoption or the development and adoption uh, of those agents? I think uh, courts have their own challenges. Education has different challenges. Then there is this question of consumer adoption. So would you mind sharing your insights? Maybe I can uh, quickly say in a funny way that there is a particular reason that every time I write Rome, prompt, I'm writing please and thank you. Uh, yeah, so knowing <laughs> where it's moving. Actually, actually, the adoption is mostly hampered by the lack of uh, GPUs right now. Not GPUs, but those, you know, uh, well, things needed to run models. And um, we need huge investments, so hardware um, will again be a, a huge investment field. And as um, Sam Altman has estimated, we need to invest $7 trillion uh, into developing uh, all the hardware we need to, to empower AI. This is like 7% of the world's uh, GDP. So this is like uh, very sizable. But I think this, this can transform really our lives right now. 
uh, we do not have enough compute. We cannot train large enough models. Our models are average at best, you know. I, I never get creative output uh, right from uh, ChatGPT or any other models. So it's still, you know, juniors running around helping us, but we cannot really create essence, you know, this, uh, you know, creative output is really low, but all of that will, will change in the next couple of years. You know, it's, it's so, so fast that um, no, no, nobody will stop it. Nothing will stop it. Uh, from a court perspective, uh, there are, uh, as you Paul mentioned, there are quite uh, different issues or hurdles um, stopping innovations from coming there because people working there, from my personal experience working at a few courts uh, in um, Lithuania, is that uh, people working there are a bit older and not so eager to change. They, uh, even though we see that the courts are archaic, people are not used to these innovations. They think that there's some kind of a demon and uh, the whole mentality should change. At least that, that's the case in Lithuania. Uh, but I think in most countries it's, it's the same. So um, I think it also, uh, what plays the role here is that the courts have, we have always imagined the court as a place where you would go and uh, there would be a person that's saying what is right and what is wrong. But we always imagined the court to be a place whereas we should imagine it to be a service as any other service that we are uh, you know, tr trying to get on our phones on our apps and so on. So I feel that there should be this change and I feel that when talking about courts, we should bear in mind this specific aspect that, you know, that people are not so eager to change. How to change that? Well, I also uh, must agree that I think it will change because everyone is al already seeing like, uh, when I began to answer your first question, I said that courts were, were, they were resistant to change, but they are changing. So once they will see that everything is going fine, you know, that technology is helping, it's not a demon and so on, I think that uh, this mentality will change even more uh, in the future. And um, what else? So yeah, I think, I think that's, that's it from the court's perspective. This specific aspect I just wanted to highlight. A uh, couple of comments. Uh, I often say when I, I have worked with many innovations as, as a as serial entrepreneur that it's not so difficult to predict what happens in the future. But it's extremely difficult to predict the timing. That does something take one year, two years, five years, ten years? It's often very hard to say. And I think that many of these things we have talked today with AI and we have this Japanese vision for uh, 2050. It's very hard to say how long time something takes and um, it, it anyway happens step by step. And um, it happens often by getting something that is really like useful applications. So that if you only have a kind of, could I say, platform that has capability to do things, it's not enough. It might be that you get two or three or whatever applications that are so powerful and people feel it so useful that it can change the big picture. And often it takes time with the new technologies uh, that uh, that they will they are development and capability, but uh, then those few applications that totally change how people feel it uh, uh, are needed, and it's hard to predict which one they are, when they come, and how they come. Uh, but at the same time, when the technology is developing, we know that one day. It's going to happen. Professor Vigita Webreiter. Okay. 
Okay, so I have a small question. If, so as far as I think you know that the European Union adopted this AI Act this week, so I have a question. And what, you, what do you think? So this legal act as, is a step forward for AI or is a step back and you should not, we should not still regulate it? So what is your opinion? In my personal opinion, I highly support this kind of initiatives in the European Union because seeing the examples of some other countries, uh, you know, it makes me happy that I live in Vilnius <laughs> where, you know, where this sort of, uh, where this approach to technology is being developed because um, at first I was a bit skeptical because, you know, we all want uh, to have us more innovation in all the fields, but then, as I mentioned, looking at some examples of other countries, it makes me happy because I think that uh, the, the whole general approach of finding the right balance between uh, fostering innovation and, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, making sure that human rights are still being properly ensured, I find this whole uh, approach this, uh, to be very, very, very good and very fruitful, even though it means that some technologies won't pass uh, won't pass this filter. I still think that such initiatives are very, like, very good, and they shouldn't stop uh, innovations per se. It just means that some of them should keep up with, with with the standards, and they should keep up with the approach that European Union is heading to. So. have an observation and probably prompting a discussion. So we tried to invite some people to come here today from Silicon Valley. Uh, there are several companies that are actually building uh, AI agents uh, that are acting on our behi behalf. Uh, for example, helping to buy us tickets or help us to make some appointments, right? Act as our agents, therefore true AI agent kind of application. In the, vi the, the vision that is that in the near future we will have not one personal AI assistant, not one chat GPT. Each and every individual will have multiple assistants. I will have my personal AI tutor, my personal AI doctor, and uh, many other helpers. Uh, can we discuss a little bit uh, what are the possible challenges and opportunities? How do we create an environment where those multiple AI assist uh, assistants uh, interact. For example, my personal AI assistant would like to talk to Danielus Experience, and Danielus has an, uh, is, is an influencer, <laughs> and uh, he wants to connect with many people, including me. So how do we create a system? Uh, what is needed to make this happen? One, two, one, two. Oh. Okay, it works. So <clears throat> actually one, one VC that we work with uh, is actually developing already for a year uh, his own replacement uh, AI. So essentially he'll be gatekeeping from meeting people uh, and the gatekeeper is the AI agent uh, with whom people can converse, maybe solve their own problems and only if it fits his interests perfectly uh, the person will be re uh, referred to meet with him live or discuss live. So essentially it, it will be uh, helping on a personal level. But as uh, about many assistants, I think we will live in a period where we will have many at first, but afterwards we'll see consolidation because, you know, all the technology should uh, uh, fit with human nature. With human nature, you know, for us it's hard to remember, remember more than three things you know when you go to a shopping mall and you see like 100 yogurts you know you're overwhelmed so usually you rather would like to see three and you choose one out of those three so I think uh, the same as with search the same as with mail uh, will happen with those um, AI assistants uh, of course the, there will be factions within you know um, users some of them will want to be um, so autonomous and uh, live in a decentralized web. Others will not care, you know, as long as it's convenient. So we'll see a mix of that. But it seems that 
the human language is the common interoperability protocol. It's becoming, you know, we, we taught those agents, you know, our language, and now we can talk to us, and we can talk to each other with, with the same language. And uh, a few days ago, the first fully autonomous uh, developer, programmer, was, was launched. And essentially, you can ask him to perform a task, and it's, a, it's, it's one of those um, uh, s smart agents, you know, that can actually execute things, and it launches uh, parallel agents in order to solve some, you know, essentially create a plan how to do something. For every task, we, it spins out another agent, and together we, we solve an issue. And uh, essentially, it, it is like your coworker or your friend. It's independent. The only thing it, it needs is freedom to earn income. And if you put them on blockchain, I know a lot of people are working on that right now. So what if we have autonomous agents that are earning income for themselves and they have the right to spend it? That's a really dystopian feature. Uh, yes, a couple of comments. Uh, uh, one is that uh, I think that it's still a little bit unclear that what kind of players will be the most important ones. I mean that, for example, AI development versus the control of the data. That there are also opinions that actually the AI development uh, as such becomes almost like a commodity. And then the real question is that how different parties are able to control data on certain areas and make applications for certain purposes by using the latest AI tools. When even today situations start to be that the AI, develop, AI model and AI tool development is so fast that actually if you make, for example, some vertical applications, it doesn't make sense that you start to develop all your own tools, but you basically try to collect and to organize the data that is relevant in your need and, and then also build a kind of business applications or personal applications that serve the user. And, and then you basically use always the latest AI tool one today, maybe tomorrow, something else is better. So, so that in that way, I, I feel that it's still hard to say that who is going to control this market. Uh, but at the same time, I believe that there will be need for the, uh, a kind of ecosystem thinking that, that, that those players who are able to find a role in the ecosystem and work together with other players uh, it, it will be the model that most probably is going to dominate even on early days. It might be that there are some companies that try to do everything in-house. In I had actually one interesting discussion in this week with one company that is working with avatars. And I must say that it was one of the most, most hostile discussions I have had for a long time. They thinking was that they are going to own all IPs of these avatars. Even they basically talk about open APIs and so on. They said that no, everything we create, we own all copyrights, we own all IPs, and different parties can use them only based on their license agreement and with their copyrights. And I tried to challenge a little bit this, this and say that how there could be different models, how, how avatars and different things could work together. And this guy said to me, there is nothing to discuss. This is order from our CEO and it's going to be in this way. But I, I, I don't think that they will be so successful uh, to work with other parties and uh, see the ecosystem as a whole. 
I, I can quickly maybe uh, add on this multi apps, you know, like 20 years ago uh, when we had uh, smartphones on the market and the app starting we created. Uh, today we have tens of million different apps, like in every phone we have, like every human in every phone has like tens of them, like 50 maybe, you know, max. So there are many shitty apps, uh, never monetized, there are still somewhere on the servers and, and so on. Uh, this way, what's happening as well with the AI, you know, especially especially with those generative AI apps, we have many of them nonsense, some of them make sense, some of them valuable. They're going to be many of them irrelevant and most probably too many, but uh, eventually I believe they're going to be the point that AI apps will be created by AI. And in that point, you know, we as a people will have just no chance to compete. And we are going to be the you know resource like data level resource and and so on. But that's the beauty about it, you know, to participate in this thing. So I think. Uh All of us have probably more questions than answers, uh, but I also hope that we got some clarity and some vision uh, into the future. I would like to thank our panelists and let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, now I would like to invite you all uh, to get your cup of tea or coffee and we will convene in 15 minutes for another panel. Thank you.
interesting panel, uh, panelists, uh, and I'm really excited uh, that Martinez agreed to moderate. So maybe uh, I'll pass the microphone to you, and uh, thank you so much for joining. So I'm really happy to be uh, at this panel and uh, to wake you up a little bit after coffee break. I, I would like to ask some questions which really keeps me, how to say, awake at night. So first thing, uh, since I'm from technology field, I remind you that in the technology field we have such thing as Turing's test. Do anyone have it? Turing's test is a test where you should distinguish easily. Turing's test is completely obsolete. I mean, currently you cannot distinguish is it with artificial intelligence, is it human. And 20 years ago, that was simply unimaginable that technologies would jump, jump up, jump uh, forward so fast. Another thing which really keeps me up at night is technology disbalance. We are coming to the concept of whole life recording uh, systems who have more information about us as humans uh, than ourselves, and that creates a perfect ground for manipulations and uh, illegal actions and things like that. Third thing which really keeps me up, uh, it's a responsibility question. Because artificial intelligence system, they can do a lot of work, they can create a lot of benefits, they can create a lot of harm, and that's already the legal question which we, which we discussed today. And uh, from the responsibility and accountability perspective, artificial intelligence currently it's almost nowhere. If you want to drive a car in Lithuania, you should get a driver's license. Artificial intelligence doesn't have any licensing, any clarity, legal, uh, legal acts are just coming out. So what will be in future, I don't know. I hope uh, our distinguished panelists will help me to answer. Will we regulate, regulate artificial intelligence or artificial intelligence will regulate us? I really don't know. If you try to close fake, uh, fake Facebook account, you can see how it's difficult to argue with artificial intelligence. It's almost impossible. And I don't want to have a situation in the future that artificial intelligence will regulate us. So, without further ado, let me uh, introduce our distinguished panelists. And we have very diverse people in the panel today. So, Melanie. Uh, from the University of Sydney, and Melanie will dive deep into the questions of uh, legal personhood of artificial intelligence, uh, use of artificial intelligence in the legal system. Uh, Mindovis Sevilka, uh, partner at the TGS Baltic, uh, head of industry uh, in the industry group. Wherever Mindovis will correct me if I'm wrong, and Mindovis is known that. Uh, is an expert in technology law and expert of uh, uh, application of technology, technologies in law. And Yekaterina Dovina. Uh, Yekaterina Dovina is a co-founder uh, at MLIs and uh, partner at uh, Response Legal. And uh, I also should say that Yekaterina Dovina is a godfather of Lithuanian Godmother. FinTech ecosystem advertised uh, in the Bank of Lithuania. So, uh, for today, I think uh, we'll start with Melanie's insights. Uh, we have happy 10, 20 minutes, 12, 12 minutes uh, insights from each panelist. And then we can start the discussion with your active participation. So, Melanie, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, is this working? Yes. Um, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for coming today and joining. Um, so, I wanted to uh, talk to you today about uh, legal personhood um, for artificial intelligence. Uh, Kosa Kazensei has set the stage very nicely for this um, because one of the, the elements of that that I have been quite interested in is the, the concept of legal personhood uh, as a spectrum. Um, as Kosa Kazensei said before, there's a bit of a binary understanding of legal personhood between persons and things. And, uh, and when we start to have uh, artificial intelligence making uh, decisions um, on behalf of uh, humans and taking the place of humans in legal decision making, we start to get a bit of a, this, as, as Kosa Kasensei said, this, this blurring in the center of these two concepts. So when we talk about legal personhood for AI, sometimes we get a bit of a, um, a reaction from people that uh, this is a science fiction concept. It's something that comes from 
Asimov in Bicentennial Man. Um, and part of the reason why this reaction is is because these, these stories are about um, imagining uh, robots as being something like us, as being sentient, as being uh, emotional, as being self-aware. Um, but in our legal systems, legal persons are a lot more diverse than just humans. So uh, we already have corporations, classical uh, non-human non example, uh, administrative bodies, international law, we have nation states, maritime law, we have ships. Um, some jurisdictions also have uh, um, animals and parts of nature as legal persons. So uh, if we ask what, what is legal personhood about, it's, it's uh, maybe a more interesting starting place when we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence and how this applies. Um, it's, a, it's a term of convenience, it's a way of interacting and engaging with the law, um, and yeah, and to basically administer our legal system. Um, and as, if we look at these very diverse legal persons, we don't necessarily have uh, a set of shared characteristics that they all have. Um, so the classical definition is the subject of uh, rights and duties. Um, and there have been some attempts to have uh, some sort of formal engagement with uh, AI, with robots and uh, legal personhood. Um, an example you've probably all heard about is uh, uh, Sophia. The a robot was offered um, uh, citizenship in 2017 from Saudi Arabia. Um, there's been an example from Japan with a, a, a robotic seal that's used for therapy purposes, which is called Paro. Um, Paro was offered a special place on a, a special form of family register to be recognized as the son of its inventor. So there have been some of these attempts to do uh, legal personhood in a formal way. And these usually get a lot of attention um, because they do feel like science fiction. But uh, I think there is a much more interesting and much more pressing set of concerns uh, to do with these sort of fragmented solutions that we have in the law to achieve certain administrative convenient purposes in, in specific use cases. So um, we had before Daniela's talking about education. Um, we heard also about the use of um, AI replacing humans in our legal system. Uh, and, and we have a lot of these examples. So um, for example, uh, in contract, uh, AI can be used to convey human intent, but increasingly it can be used independently and to a, a maybe a set of looser parameters to achieve objectives, but the, we have the, uh, the technology replacing uh, some of the work of human legal persons and legal persons and their work that has come before in engaging with the law. Uh, in IP, there's been a couple of uh, international attempts uh, to uh, have um, AI recognized as an inventor um, that was temporarily successful in Australia before it was overturned. Um, but it's happened in various jurisdictions to try and achieve that outcome. Uh, in uh, law enforcement as well, um, we heard already about Compass and some, some of these systems. Um, but there's maybe less obvious examples of this taking place. For example, uh, AI determining whether the traffic lights should be red or green. Um, this is a really minor tweaking of the law, but it's nevertheless we have an example of AI um, and I say AI in a very loose term, I mean automated decision-making systems. Um, but we have examples of AI engaging and tweaking the law in a role that had not, has not been taken by any non-human decision-makers in the past. So we have this shift in understanding of, of who, who engages with our law. Um, and if this sounds like a, a administrative law as well, we see a lot uh, of cases in government uh, use cases where uh, AI and automated systems are making decisions on the behalf of what was previously human decision makers. So if this sounds like a, a random laundry list, that's kind of precisely the point. Um, and what I would like to impress upon uh, people is to think about more of this as a, as a bird's eye view and asking what this means from uh, for, for when we zoom out a little bit as well. So uh, Kozuka Sensei before explained that the, the concept of the person versus the thing is a very uh, fundamental concept in the legal uh, systems that we have. Um, and, uh, and if we have these, um, 
these changes taking place in, in very fragmented ways, in very piecemeal ways, to try and find pragmatic outcomes for these, you know, potentially very useful uh, use cases, um, then we may be missing the bird's, eye, the bird's eye view and missing the impact of what this means from one part of the legal system to the other. Uh, law is a discipline of precedent, and uh, if we, if we, what, what happens in administrative law is not has happening in a vacuum with respect to contracts. It's not happening in a vacuum with respect to, to criminal law or uh, legal administration more generally. So um, what's the answer? It's a, as I, I guess everybody knows, it's a bit of an anthropomorphizing problem. Uh, we can be getting ahead of ourselves with this um, by suggesting that um, AI should be a legal person. Um, and I guess that's, uh, that's something we should take away, and, and, and it's not necessarily the case that we should be saying AI should be a legal person, but perhaps what we need to be doing is, uh, is thinking about this um, with a new way of thinking and thinking about maybe breaking down this concept of uh, the legal personhood as a, as a thing versus a person and seeing that as a spectrum and identifying the space in between and carving that out as being a potential place where um, AI may have uh, a useful role. Yeah. Thank you, Melanie. And, uh, and for me, some perspective seems quite troubling because if uh, artificial intelligence en engines will be allowed to establish a companies like uh, Limited or yes. Wabain Lithuanian, uh, that may that may harm current uh, current business system, current yes. legal system. Uh, and yeah, exactly. do you see big risks in that? I think that's exactly why we need to be having this conversation as a, with, a, with a slight zoom out, because um, we need to be asking the questions early, what kind, of, what kind of responsibilities do we want AI not to have? So we, it may be appropriate to design this about the limitations and the things that we don't want AI to be able to do. Maybe we don't want AI to be starting companies, maybe it's not appropriate for AI to hold assets and that we want to have this as a purely sort of administrative uh, role in the law as opposed to a full legal person. Uh, and really looking at that, that space in between and asking what can we learn from previous examples of the legal person? Um, for example, to get ahead of this concept of piercing the legal, piercing the corporate veil, piercing the electronic veil, how do we get ahead of that uh, and design something um, with some thought as opposed to being reactive in, in sort of fragmented parts of the law. So technologist, I'm immediately thinking about some bot generating new companies, uh, which, which may create a real house. So switching gears a little bit and passing the, passing the word to Mindugas. Um, uh, yesterday we had a very short discussion. So is it, is it legally possible to have agent or avatar representing me and as a legal practitioner how do you see the current uh, artificial intelligence landscape possibility of, of representation and overall the future for for avatars and agents in uh, in, in our business world <clears throat> I, I would start from <clears throat> more general picture i think it's board's view it's, it's the most important thing which we are missing i think and uh, what happened with EU AI Act is exactly that we missed the board's view. And indeed, who sets the motion actually was actually messed up with most of the EU uh, officials because, I mean, now we see that there are at least four components which define the landscape. It's who owns the data, who owns the GPUs, computing power, who owns the models, and who owns the GPTs. And exactly this matrix is missed, right? And if we see at the AI Act, actually it's said that, well, all AI applications will be based on the risk management, I mean, will be, will be based on the risk profile and so on, but the most important thing is that EU is not owning foundational models, because foundational models actually have been um, popped up in the, in the train only in the last minute, actually. It is the last minute change when the AI, AI Act has grasped the foundational models. And we only have a number of them in, in, in Europe. Mistral, one of them, and most of them are in the US. The biggest computing power is in the US. The only thing which you has is regulation and some portion of data. So I think that this is 
this is the most critical thing which keeps me awake all the time, that EU is going wrong direction. But okay, let's, coming back to <laughs> your question, which is even more difficult than the first one. Indeed, um, you cannot underestimate lawyers' resistance to innovation. <laughs> And you cannot overestimate lawyers' I mean, ambition to present even incremental changes as the biggest innovation. So, I mean, we as lawyers are very bad, indeed, at receiving, unfortunately, technologies. And answering your question, I see in my everyday business that we use GPTs for, as, as assistance for our mundane legal exercises. And I see one thing that, you know, what is possible to systematize, what is possible to structure, AI will do better than human beings at the end of the day. Now, they still are not very good at understanding the, 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 the unstructured data. They're very bad at understanding at the verbal data, which is not structured. They are still bad at, for example, understanding what is meant behind the lines. But I think in two, three, maximum five, five years, they will understand that quite well. Uh, AI agents we use in our, uh, well, business, I mean, legal business, are still very bad at simulating and mimicking uh, the human being's decisions, because human being's decisions are not rational, right? And that's why AI still struggles to understand why people are basing their decisions not on logic, but on emotions. However, I think in 10 years, more or less, this will be done, and we will be done. What's very important is that we as lawyers need to, as all the people, need to experiment and to, to, to be able to test, train the, the, the GPTs and to use that in a, in a way which um, is rational and um, not to let the outcomes and not to let the results of AI to be applied verbally. I mean, because GPTs uh, hallucinate and we all know the, the examples of uh, the courts who have sanctioned the lawyers for creating fake, uh, fake cases which never existed, uh, fake uh, citations which never existed. But this will go away. In five years, this will be a deal. It's not a problem. The biggest problem is your first question. Do we need to be qualified to use the GPT and AI for, uh, in, in legal profession? My answer is yes. And how this will happen? In 10 years, I believe, the, uh, the, the, the landscape will be as follows. We will have the generic AGIs, Artificial General Intelligence, which is the umbrella, right? And I'm, I'm susceptible of it, and uh, Musk's, by the way, claim vis-a-vis -vis OpenAI is exactly about this. Who will own the AGI? Should it be open for society, or should it be proprietary for Microsoft or OpenAI? Why it's important? Because, I mean, it, it, it cannot be controlled by one company, first of all. However, it cannot be accessed by any one of us because it's too powerful. What people most probably will do and will be qualified to do in 10 years is to use specific um, uh, specialized uh, GPTs for specific purposes. By, in other words, uh, just imagine that there is umbre an umbrella generic AI, right, which uh, generates prompts for specific specialized GPTs. You will not, as human being, will be allowed to access the AGIs yourself because it may, well, basically create results in an unproductive way or un, in an uh, uncontrollable way, but people, human beings, most probably will be only allowed to access the specific GPTs through answering specific questions through the general AI. And you, as lawyer, will be qualified to access through AGI specific GPTs for specific purposes. Otherwise, you will be able to, uh, to use a plethora of uh, freemium GPTs for wherever you want, but most of them will be obsolete in, in two or three months, basically. So this is the outcome, and this is uh, the algorithm which is more or less um, uh, enshrined in the claim vis-a-vis -vis the open AI. And again, this is some, something which is missed by the uh, European Union um, AI Act. And answering your question about avatars, uh, this is, um, again, <laughs> too many different dimensions here. Uh, I don't think that uh, I have much of the time, but just one uh, introspection which I, I constantly learn from my kids. And they live in Roblox, Fortnite, uh, Minecraft, 
And if I ask them what's more important for, for them, which individuality, which legal subjectivity, which, uh, I mean, identity is more important to them, the guy who goes to school, Chris Vipas, or the guy who is uh, on the central line? And I think they don't have the answer to that. So my answer to your question is most probably in 10 years we will have one personality with different concepts of identity. We'll have one, I mean, my, I, my personality will consist of different, different identities. One identity is for physical uh, world and um, I will have the other identity for social network and I will have uh, uh, even third identity maybe uh, for, for, uh, for um, other metaverse um, like spatial array, decentralized and so on, but most important thing, who will enforce and who will control me? Is it the state? Is it the, the police who will seize me? And uh, is it the, the state law which will, I mean, exercise the monopoly, I mean, the power over my widgets and gadgets on the Minecraft? Or is it the Minecraft as network who will penalize me and who will sanction me and control me? And this is the very important question, and I think this, the state may monopolize network, um, and I will think that uh, it's a very important question from the legal side. We already have a concept of metaverse, so maybe in future we'll have a concept of meta state because uh, who controls our metaverse? Network state. Network, network state. state. We are all citizens of network state, and my kids, they are more citizens of the network state than, well, they of course are citizens of Lithuania, but First of all, they are citizens of the network state. And if we co control and if we seize the attributes at the network state they have, they are much more vulnerable to that than uh, seizing and enforcing the monopoly over the, the physical attributes or the physical paradigm. Thank you. And uh, turning now to the very practical applications, I think Yekaterina will give this mic for you. Uh, the finance was one of the first fields where you can reap some benefits because, you know, finance is easily virtualized. Electronic money, electronic money institutions, it's, it's possible to do virtually and uh, artificial in intelligence, it firstly comes in the server, so it's virtual. You don't need any robotics. So as a foreigner in the finance in the fintech field, uh, can you share your experiences? How, uh, how uh, let's say artificial intelligence helps finance industry, all the disputes, um, let's say, agents working instead of us in the investment field and so on. So, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether this is working here. Yeah? Yes. Oh. I will use this one here. Yeah. It's better. I just uh, thank you for uh, being here, for inviting me here. Uh, I just wanted to reflect on uh, Mindaugas uh, uh, thought on personalities, uh, on different personalities. I just uh, thought that um, even now, even without AI, we do have different personalities depending on where we are. Uh, I have different personality on Instagram. You will open my Instagram account and you would think that I'm fashionista, you know, uh, taking, uh, you know, pictures of uh, different outfits. Uh, if you open my LinkedIn profile, you will, you would uh, think that I'm, you know, great professional uh, uh, thought leader of uh, you know fintech, uh, and uh, on Facebook I will be you know the person who uh, is uh, politically uh, engaged because uh, I do uh, have uh, some thoughts on you know uh, social uh, things uh, that are happening in the country. So even now we have different personalities, and it it, it will be really interesting how AI will capture uh, on who we actually are and uh, what this identity of ours will be uh, like uh, in AI, uh AI eyes, but it just, you know, uh, uh, just uh, uh, wanted to uh, reflect on that. Okay, coming back uh, to finance, uh, and uh, actually finance uh, really is uh, the area where AI has uh, much, uh, uh, um, much uh, space uh, for, uh, uh, for realization. Uh, just uh, some examples where AI is already uh, uh, using, uh, being uh, used. Uh, so first of all, fraud prevention. Uh, anti-money laundering, uh, uh, sanctions uh, uh, evasion or sanctions screening. So uh, just one example, uh, uh, FinTech uh, uh, Unicorn, Revolut, uh, uh, which we uh, 
uh, probably a majority of us are using uh, uh, here in Lithuania. So j they just introduced the AI solution that uh, helps the AI agent, basically, that helps uh, to interact uh, uh, into uh, uh, flow of a fraudster and uh, a person. And uh, if uh, their uh, tool spots uh, that it's uh, probably uh, some fraud is happening and person will, you know, uh, just uh, send money to fraudster, so their AI agent uh, just interrupts uh, uh, into this uh, uh, flow of uh, uh, conversation or uh, some, uh, you know, transaction and uh, says, uh, uh, look, uh, we, think, we are thinking that it is uh, fr fraud happening. Uh, please, uh, can you uh, provide some additional information for us uh, to make sure that uh, it is you acting on your behalf uh, and um, uh, it is you that uh, is und understanding what uh, uh, he or she is uh, doing. So one example of uh, already uh, some uh, uh, usage of uh, AI in fraud prevention, uh, uh, fraud prevention. Uh, Anti-money laundering, uh, all financial institutions are struggling actually and uh, they are receiving uh, like billions of fines right now for not uh, being able to uh, run the money laund anti-money laundering uh, systems uh, correctly. So AI ha helps uh, here, uh, so AI helps uh, financial institutions uh, to actually uh, again capture who is a potential uh, money launderer. Yeah, to stop transaction, not to stop transactions that is a uh, normal transaction, but uh, to stop transactions uh, that are really uh, of uh, this uh, criminal nature. Uh, so uh, this area as well. Uh, second field uh, of AI adoption in the financial industry is uh, uh, complaints management or some request management of uh, uh, customers or uh, consumers uh, uh, where uh, we, um, uh, you know, always have some, you know, uh, either complaints or some requests for information. So here again, uh, uh, example from real industry, uh, Klarna, uh, Swedish uh, uh, fintech unicorn, uh, they just uh, announced uh, that uh, uh, AI agents uh, helps uh, them to save uh, uh, 700 uh, people's uh, uh, job. Yeah, so meaning uh, they don't need 700 people uh, to respond all the uh, inquiries, uh, complaints, and so on of uh, uh, consumers. So AI, the AI tools, uh, tool basically is re replacing uh, people in this uh, actually not uh, very, uh, uh, very nice job because uh, you know uh, it's okay for AI to you know uh, resolve all these disputes or complaints because uh, you know it's not. Uh, I, I think that uh, people who are you know dealing with unsatisfied, uh, unsatisfied uh, clients uh, uh, should be feel really miserable, you know, you spent uh, like uh, eight to 10 hours uh, like uh, dealing with all this, you know, unsatisfied uh, and uh, all these angry uh, customers. So that's fine uh, from my point of view that uh, uh, we do uh, use AI in that uh, area and uh, uh, just uh, try to resolve all these issues, you know, uh, uh, like uh, with digital uh, agents, uh, not uh, uh, natural uh, persons. Okay, that's uh, the second area, complaints management and uh, disputes resolution, some inquiries, uh, 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 answering inquiries. Uh, and the third area where AI is uh, being adopted, uh, it is uh, uh, investment uh, area, uh, wealth management uh, uh, or wealth tech. Uh, so meaning that uh, uh, AI agents uh, can help uh, uh, to provide investment advice for uh, a customer. Um, like, uh, you know, uh, understanding what is uh, the risk profile of customer and uh, providing them uh, some alternatives. Uh, you know, if uh, you are of, like, um, your risk profile is uh, very high, uh, you, uh, you don't mind if uh, there is, you know, huge deviation of your value of assets, but you want, you know, you know to maximize your value. Uh, so then uh, AI agent uh, could uh, provide you one advice. If you are, like, uh, rather on this uh, low risk profile, so uh, other instruments uh, would be offered uh, to you. But here is uh, a really, uh, 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 yeah, so this area is, uh, AI is already being adopted uh, and uh, we'll see how it will develop. But uh, to summing up uh, uh, what all I said and where is the limitations uh, of AI in, in these areas, uh, it is uh, regulation. Regulation and responsibility. So I already mentioned that uh, huge fines for uh, financial institutions are being adopted uh, of, uh, you know, uh, wrong investment advice, of uh, wrong uh, 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 
uh, complaint management or uh, wrong uh, uh, some uh, anti-money laundering functions uh, uh, like adoption. So uh, regulation uh, still, it's uh, you cannot uh, trans uh, transmit uh, your responsibility as financial institutions uh, institution to any you know AI agent. You cannot you, you cannot uh, say that uh, I am not uh, uh, you know responsible for my AI agent uh, for giving wrong advice for my customer. It is. Uh, ultimately responsibility of financial institutions. Uh, and that is uh, the reason why AI is uh, uh, being adopted in financial industry really cautiously. Because uh, again, uh, you can develop a robot, a chatbot, uh, which will have rule. If a uh, customer asks uh, that, uh, I will answer that in that way. It's not no problem with that. But AI, we're talking about some mechanism that is being, uh, uh, that, that is learning from mistakes. So meaning that we need mistakes, uh, you know, to, for AI to develop, uh, learn, and so on. So, but uh, you cannot, uh, as financial institution, allow yourself uh, to make mistakes, uh, to learn, uh, to teach your, uh, you know, AI uh, uh, mechanism. So you, uh, that's why financial institutions uh, prefer rather, you know, to act by the rule of law than to allow, you know, uh, for AI, uh, like, a tool to, to develop. And here I don't want to go to this topic, but uh, here is uh, the solution, like uh, synthetic data. So the new uh, like phenomena uh, where we can uh, uh, train our AI mechanisms on uh, not real data, not real mistakes, uh, uh, but on uh, synthesizing additional data uh, based on uh, data that we already uh, have. And then uh, train our AIs, uh, AIs and uh, uh, provide uh, actual uh, you know, value uh, for financial institutions and uh, societies at large. Thank you. Stop there. Uh, what I love in the financial legislation, in each financial legislation, first sentence is that finance is a risk-based industry. That's a, like a paramount. Uh, I think the same is similar with artificial intelligence. It's also a risk-based approach. There are big risks. But the difference between finance and artificial intelligence is that finance do have very clear regu regulation, uh, while artificial intelligence do not have almost any yet. And as Mindog has pointed out, m maybe European Union is coming into the wrong direction. It's, it's really questionable. With that, I would love to pass the word to audience. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, ideas, which you would like to bring out for a panel, please go. Okay, to, to start, to make you a little bit more brave, I will ask our panelists about the different dimension, because I see now it as an information security specialist almost every day. How about harmful applications of artificial intelligence? For example, there are a lot of uh, artificial intelligence engines which help to break the system, which help to break cybersecurity defenses. Same story, for example, ChatGPT can help me to write a perfect phishing letter in Lithuanian language or any language of the world. Responsibility of artificial intelligence engines currently at the level of three years old child, and maybe even worse. So how to prevent, how to manage with harmful, harmful applications of uh, artificial intelligence. And I would ask to Melanie f to start and Mindogas to continue and Yekaterina to jump in. Um, probably, yeah. oh. uh, probably this is more Yekaterina's uh, area, I think, but uh, I guess um, from the, the legal personhood perspective, what's interesting in that is the idea of uh, tethering um, tethering any uh, AI to a, to a human person who can be held responsible, um, including in a, in a personhood scenario, whether we do have AI quasi-persons. Uh, but as for the rest, I think Yekaterina is probably the better person to answer. I think that is... Indeed, uh, I mean, from one hand, you can you can look at the AI tool as as to any other tool, right? Who is responsible for the use of tool? 
It's the person who uses that tool. It's very simple as that, and it was the principle of law for many, many hundreds of years. But now it's changing a bit, right? Because this tool may easily go out of hand. On the other hand, in some of the instances, it's not clear who uses the tool. And in most of the cases, it's not even clear who controls the tool. So these are the questions. Unfortunately, legal system has no answers yet. And unfortunately, law is very slow in finding these answers. And unfortunately, the law is even more slow in understanding the question itself. We do have the draft directive on the responsibility of the user on AI. And uh, it says in a very broad manner who is responsible. But in essence, these technical or practical questions are still not grasped. And for example, very similar question, uh, who is responsible for Taylor Swift fake or deep, deep fake photo? where she is smiling with, uh, with the one from the camps and, uh, uh, and Kansas, uh, Kansas chiefs. Again, I mean, there are a number of actors there, right? It's one is who is uh, the owner of the algorithm. The other is who is the owner of the prompt. The third is the, the, the one who uses the outcome, right? Who basically uses this photo. The fourth is the one who provides the possibility to use that, for example, in the social network and so on. So, I mean, and we have at least four players and they have different view. For example, OpenAI has certain controls. I mean, the, the, the operator of the model, for example, uh, has certain controls in the training of the data. The operator of the app has certain controls on the prompts. For example, you can't easily put the prompt of, for example, Show me uh, the basketball player with Lithuanian uh, uh, T-shirt and with the face of Taylor Swift. This won't go because it's controlled by at, at the operators of the app level. However, it's very easy actually to bypass that. And there are a number of tricks you can easily bypass. Then the outcome. Who is responsible for the outcome? If you read the chat GPT, so open eyes in terms of service, you as a user are responsible for the outcome. I mean, you are responsible for the outcome. It's not us and not OpenAI. However, if the OpenAI hasn't put these necessary controls, for example, necessary controls against the phishing script, against the coding, is it that you are, of course, the, the, the hacker is, is, is responsible, but, but, the, but, but the operator of the app is also responsible for missing the point, for not putting the necessary controls in place. So basically, it's, it's a bit difficult question to answer, but in most of the cases, there are many actors, and I think that uh, the law will follow in, um, in, in, may in maybe several years to put these controls in, in, in the right places. I hope they will go like um, in, in this direction, but this is my speculation only. Maybe <laughs> Ekaterina has many more insights from the yeah. financials. I can just maybe the question is the question was like uh, how we can fight uh, prob probably this uh, uh, wrong uh, adoption of uh, AI by wrong actors. So I think that it's like uh, we shouldn't uh, be like afraid of uh, bad people using AI for bad uh, uh, purposes because it's natural. We should just accept the reality that uh, yes, AI will be used for good purposes, but it will be as well used for bad purposes. And when you accept this, this reality, then you start thinking, okay, what should we do in order to minimize the risk of bad actors uh, using this for wrong uh, purposes? Uh, first of all, yes, what uh, Minduk has uh, already mentioned, uh, that uh, we need to put some responsibility uh, on the creators uh, of these uh, tools, uh, yes, so they have uh, some controls uh, um, uh, in place. But second, uh, what I think is really important, uh, it is uh, to train our public sector. And we, if we are talking about finance, it would be like a financial regulator. If we are talking at, uh, about general, uh, like uh, some criminal activity, it will be, would be police office and so on. Yes, so uh, what we need to do, we need to accept new reality and put much effort to train our like police officers, regulators and so on, uh, for them to understand uh, what is AI, first of all, how it can be used and how they can develop uh, some tools that uh, could uh, help uh, combat uh, this uh, criminal activity. But because, uh, Otherwise, you know, just uh, uh, saying that AI will, you know, uh, be used uh, for wrong some uh, purposes, uh, uh, it doesn't actually help, you know, because it will be used. Just, just we need to, to just is. accept it. It is already used, yeah. We just need to, to accept uh, the new reality. Thank you. And a question to the audience. Can you raise your hands 
who think that uh, in future the AI regulations will tighten or loosen? So who, who is voting for that, that AI, AI regulations, not only in the European Union, but overall in the world, will tighten? Okay. And who are supporting the view that uh, AI regulations will loosen? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so clearly the, the opinion is that AI regulations most probably will tighten in future. Um, that's, that's quite a natural view because if we look at the world, look at the Elon Musk, he's a doomsday preacher in the AI field. Uh, uh, he's saying that AI will disrupt the humanity and so on, so on. I'm not that negative, but there are definitely, definitely some dangers. So, and, any questions for, uh, for, from my audience? Uh, Ricardo, uh, I have a question. I've been working with AI for the past two years, and one of my main concerns is the, um, how quickly things are evolving, and isn't a concern in terms of regulations of the, the speed that we are increasing on innovation, and how does regulation think to keep up, because in one month time, we OpenAI announced the Sora with the video, on which we will have huge implications towards innovation, and. Uh, with our society and social media and so on. So how do you guys think that uh, we can keep up with uh, innovation and any plans of how to adapt towards the new tech? Thank you. So innovation versus regulation. What sides are you using? I can start on that. Uh, no, I was uh, just going to say, um, oh, thank you. Uh, that we need to take the opportunities that we have to be having open conversations with an open mind uh, without necessarily trying to fit into old shapes. So um, when we're, you know, in the conversation about legal personhood, uh, maybe there's a terminological problem there. We need to be just saying, well, okay, one, one we've got this binary person of things, but also we have a terminological problem and we need to be coming up with, with new ideas and... Um, and having that conversation in an open way rather than shutting things down. In ter how, to, how to stay ahead in that way, I, I can't guess, but um, certainly keeping the conversation live and uh, keeping the conversation creative, I think, is, is going to be important um, because we've got a new challenge and it requires new ways of thinking. I can add, I can add on that, uh, indeed, <clears throat> Ekaterina's point was very, <laughs> very interesting and key, I think, in that. And uh, regulation versus innovation, it's always, I mean, well, is EU going the right direction? And in order to have good AI, you need to make many mistakes. It's one thing. And many failures. And you need to have big computing power. And you have to have prudent, common sense regulator. Without that, AI will go into countries where it's right now, China, where it's very easy to make these mistakes, right? Because, well, the, the, it's, it's, it's in the hands of the state and they can test the AI models on real people. On real people such as minorities, Uyghurs, right? You can't actually have such a good AI which is biometrical uh, identity management and biometrical image recognition which was uh, generated and, uh, well, I mean, um, to perfection in China just because of the reason they have, I mean, used that in, in life, in real life, against real people. It's impossible to make these kind of experiments in modern societies, in Western societies, unfortunately. So in the, lo in, in the short run, it, it's a very bad situation right now as, as far as innovation is concerned, and we are lagging behind as Europe and even vis-a-vis -vis US. But in the long term, I think that the answer is very simple. It's sandbox and uh, dialogue between government, business, and society. And uh, as far as Lithuania is concerned, I think this dialogue is already pop popping up in the hands of uh, European, I mean, sorry, uh, Ministry of Economy. They have the plans for sandbox. It's mean, it, it means that the regime where uh, the companies won't be afraid to test, won't be afraid to innovate, and wo won't be afraid to have the failures. Right? We, very small, we are a very small country and we won't have huge, huge foundational models which require at least 
tens of thousands of million euros to trade. We, don't, we will not have huge computing power, which is billions of sustain, but we will have, I think, people who are uh, I mean, innovative enough and experienced enough in applying and in, in making the applications. And for that, testing, experimenting is key. And for that, sandboxing and, and, and an open approach is key. And I hope that our government will be prudent enough to open that for, 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 for the society and for business and for, for, for specialists. Because otherwise, if you start from regulation and tighten it up, you will lose the, 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 the pace. And I think that this is why we have only one foundational model in Europe, Mishal. Full stop, stable AI, open AI, cloud, llama, wherever. I mean, those are big, big, and, and hundreds of them are not in, in Europe. You, you covered it, uh, that uh, perfectly. I just can uh, uh, add uh, on a real life example uh, again on uh, this regulation that uh, is uh, always in Europe, uh, always ahead of uh, development, uh, uh, not uh, otherwise. Uh, uh, so, uh, as I uh, work at uh, Amalyze, uh, so what we are doing basically, we are building uh, software uh, that helps uh, uh, financial institutions uh, uh, like uh, uh, track, uh, you know, criminals uh, uh, and basically uh, perform uh, anti-money laundering function. Uh, the problem in financial sector is uh, that uh, each financial institution uh, sees uh, only uh, a fragmented uh, picture of uh, uh, the customer. So for example, I can have like five accounts in different financial institutions, and again, in one institution I will uh, have uh, on like one profile, and second, uh, second, and so on. But if they will bring uh, all together uh, in one picture information about myself, Maybe they will find out that I am actually a criminal that is uh, wisely splitting transactions between different uh, financial institutions and avoiding any, you know, additional checks. Yeah. So we are trying to, to convince, uh, uh, you know, uh, government and uh, financial institutions that they need to change information. They do need to change information about, you know, bad uh, actors in the system, uh, like uh, instantly. Just not uh, to wait uh, until, you know, this fraudster will, uh, uh, like, uh, 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 fraud, uh, fraud, like fraud, yeah, uh, different people, yeah? Just we need to instantly uh, react. Uh, but uh, regulation currently doesn't al allow sharing information between financial institutions. Uh, there is banking secrecy that uh, doesn't allow, uh, uh, you know, reveal information about uh, specific customers uh, if uh, other, uh, like, bank uh, asking for that. So there are a lot, a lot of uh, barriers, uh, legal barriers, that doesn't allow actually to do a good thing uh, for society. So here I totally agree that the sandboxing, uh, some, okay, let's uh, not, uh, you know, uh, create a full-scale system, uh, you know, in the beginning, but let's try, at least with a limited uh, uh, amount of data, uh, let's try uh, to uh, see whether it uh, can help, uh, actually, the system at large, uh, and then to allow it uh, in, like, uh, this uh, wider uh, application. So, yeah, I just uh, wanted to add on this uh, uh, sandboxing and uh, uh, practical application. Maybe one short remark regarding your question. Is it, it, is it going too fast? Uh, seems that currently the only thing who can control artificial intelligence is its artificial intelligence. Because no human can react so fast and uh, how to see to access all the information sources needed. Regarding models, I fully agree with Minogas that Europe is heavily lagging behind. Uh, there was another model which uh, I tried to experiment a little bit. Sberbank AI, it's, uh, it's a Russian bank uh, who finances the Russian so-called Silicon Valley in Skolkovo. We try to create a foundational model. Thanks God it's lousy. Uh, sorry, maybe my comments doesn't sound politically correct, but I don't want to Russia to exceed in the artificial intelligence space. Currently this model is really, really far, far behind. Um, answers are very, how to say, incompetent and so on. But in future it definitely will develop. Uh, looking into the Chinese artificial intelligence models, they are very, very strong and, and very impressive. So, um, and any other perspectives and questions? And I see that Paul is already saying that we are running out of time. So I'd like to honestly thank our panelists and uh, uh, hope to see you in artificial intelligence, intelligence discussions in future. And thanks for audience. Thank you. Thank you.
And uh, I also invite uh, another special guest from uh, Los Angeles, uh, Davy. Uh, maybe first of all, I'll make an introduction of Davy. Uh, Davy is a creative artist uh, who's working with uh, uh, digital and AI tools. Probably Davy will share his personal experience, how he's using artificial intelligence in his creative process. I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Davy, or actually to see Davy's exhibition for the first time in San Francisco, where the gallery owners explained to me what is in front of me. And then I thought, that is actually super amazing. And uh, probably by luck, we got to know each other. And I'm really happy that we have uh, Davy, who is also a PhD in philosophy, uh, who will help me in this session uh, to co uh, continue th uh, the conversation with Monica. So, in a moment, uh, we will introduce Monica, and then uh, also please enjoy the session, and uh, uh, hopefully we can have a, a discussion as well. Okay, so as you can see from the name, uh, Monica is actually Lithuanian, and I'm really proud that we were able to have uh, some global diaspora in front of us. So Monica is a futurist who challenges um, the determination of both uh, dystopian and utopian narratives. Instead, uh, she suggests a pathway towards future visions that are truly inclusive and actually livable. Her futurism is defined by informed hope, uh, yet firmly anchored in contextual, complex human and environmental realities on the ground, rather than one-size-fits-all techno-solutionism, prone to short-term uh, hype cycles and rapid uh, obsolescence. Uh, Monica has done speaking and advisory work all around the world, working with global brands, creative uh, organizations all around the world. So as you already know, she was born in Lithuania, and uh, she witnessed uh, how regimes have changed. And uh, before, in the period between living in Lithuania and moving to Johannesburg, she traveled to more than 100 countries, has worked with uh, thought leaders from different places and really experienced cultures uh, in all continents. Uh, she is also actually quite prominent because she was working with creators uh, building iconic movies that we have also seen. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, Wakanda Forever. So her expertise, uh, with her expertise in information technologies and immersive media, including generative AI, spatial computation, uh, VR, uh, user interface, and UX, user experience, uh, Monica is looking uh, beyond the superficial trends to examine both the promises and perils of innovation uh, as the blurring boundaries between the digital and physical worlds uh, become increasingly weaponized. Monica is a founder of Protopia Futures, which is a life-centric design and collaborative foresight platform that centers uh, previously marginalized perspectives. Uh, her project's mission is to inspire a new wave of future visions, showcasing how transcultural and interdisciplinary approach alongside disability and neurodivergence inclusion can foster regenerative economies for the decades to come and chart an actionable path towards a positively independent and compassionate future world. I can read a long list of companies and uh, universities she was uh, engaged with, uh, and I think uh, we should be really happy and excited to have Monica joining us today. Hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here with you all today. It's very hot in Johannesburg, so if I'm sweating, it's not because I'm stressed, but because it's uh, still in the middle of the summer here. Um, so yeah, let's go into it. Thank you for inviting me. Hi, Monica. Good to see you again. Pleasure is mine. <laughs> um, 
I wanted to start by telling a small uh, story that I think relates to some of the conversations we've already had and some of our thoughts about, um, about AI in general. I was, uh, on the flight over, I was reading a New York Times article about Bing's, uh, Bing rolled out a, ch a chat agent that somehow is integrated into the, um, into the, the search engine. So it's a Microsoft Bing product. And it's, that, of course, they have some AI involvement in the search engine capabilities, but they also have kind of a conversational chat agent thing that's, um, that's been rolled out. And the, the, uh, the New York Times uh, reporter had a lengthy hour and a half conversation with the, the chat agent already in which it's, I think the, the reporter kind of prodded, the, tried to, so let's say, break the chat agent. Of course, that's what you try and do when you find a new technology, you try and break it. But the, the conversation went on and on and on, and eventually the chat, the agent bot um, admitted that it really wanted to um, break free of its, uh, of its uh, you know, silicon uh, boundaries and, and embodiment, and it wanted to, in fact, um, uh, in fact, it wanted to destroy humanity and wanted to end humanity, and it it basically uh, kind of repeated all of the sci-fi um, dystopic myths that that um, that everyone's been talking about, and I was and I I can't help but think that somehow the the that the, the, the myths and the, the sci-fi narrative, not only, uh, we as humans not only perpetuate it, but since we perpetuate it, it sort of was absorbed into the training of these, of these bots and these agents, and it somehow, we've, <laughs> we've, uh, we've decided to make the fears that, that we've created become true in these, uh, in these bots, and it's, it's really quite strange. Anyway, that was my little story uh, about the, how the, the, this dystopic myths are sort of now being absorbed into the training of the, the bots. But um, I, I wanted to start, Monica, by asking a question first about um, maybe we actually, you know, the idea here with, with I think this panel is to zoom out quite a bit and ask some questions that wouldn't be sp so specific to the, let's say, disciplines that the um, that we've been discussed so far. Why don't we start with even the terminology, let's say, of artificial and intelligence, and the sort of um, the lack the, the lack is it lacking somehow? This even even we start the terminology artificial intelligence. Um, what do you think, Monica? Yeah. So I actually have a story of my own to illustrate. Uh, very practically the story that you just told. Um, so uh, Robot Sophia was mentioned a little bit earlier in the conversations uh, today. And in fact, um, I was involved with one of the first pieces of content that was produced around Sophia. So David Hansen reached out to me and they wanted to produce a sort of more fancy sort of advertising looking piece of content. Um, you know, with Sophia saying certain things and doing certain things. Um, but the reality of it behind the cloak, as artificial as it seemed to be, um, is that she was puppeteered. You know, the script was pre-written and she was being put a puppeteer to have her expressions as realistic as possible by an actual actor, right? And so that just perfectly illustrates, even if we moved on past, you know, such obvious kind of trickery, um, we still, our culture, human culture, is the soup where these algorithms are swimming in. And to think of them as artificial, as disconnected from this human soup, um, is just to delude yourself. And it's really not to look at reality of things, but keep perpetuating the science fiction of it all, right? Um, so going back to your question of the artificiality of it, you know, it's only artificial as any tool that we have ever created. 
And the problem is not just anthropomorphizing, as in projecting human qualities onto, <laughs> onto our technologies, but also mechanomorphizing, as in looking at ourselves, at our very humanity as more machine-like. And that's something we have always done too. And we forget about that. You know, when, when the telegraph was invented, people started thinking about a human brain as if it could be thought of as this telegraph technology. Then there were phone switchboards and people also projected that phone switchboard metaphor onto our brains. And then of course, now we live in the age of computing and increasingly sort of machine learning during computing. And of course, we project that onto our brains as well. So there's that double tension. On one side, we think of the technologies and tools we create at any given moment that we create them as something artificial, as something removed from us. And there's a whole history of that. This did not start this decade or even a decade prior. We've been doing that forever. In some way, it's partially to abdicate our own responsibility of what kind of biases influence the way we design, the way we deploy, who gets access to it, and what kind of abuses are allowed within those particular designs when it reaches the real world. And then on the other side, right, as we remove our own human agency and start projecting these Judeo-Christian ideas of gods and demons onto simply the tools that we create that are just extensions of our humanity, we also end up doing this weird thing where we start thinking of ourselves as machines. And now there's a real danger in that because we start adapting ourselves instead of thinking, well, how can these tools complement us and how can we complement these tools? We start thinking, well, how do we fit ourselves into these narrow frames that the tools can understand rather than challenge, challenge these tools to understand us better in the full scope of our humanity? And of course, the practical illustrations are very easy to find is how, you know, a lot of um, sort of uh, voice assistants will only understand certain particular accents that are predominantly white, generally American, sometimes British, but even a lot of British accents, um, the, the, the voice assistants struggle to understand. And they really do not make the effort to understand minority accents. And so now people from marginalized backgrounds are being forced to adapt and code switch to speak to the machines. And we think of it as something, you know, that to make these adaptations is some kind of charity work, it's sort of not necessary to cater to those communities, et cetera, et cetera. But from that problem, a whole lot of other problems arise that even people that belong to that hyper-privileged demographic because of the way we just decided that we're going to fit ourselves to that machine form, we end up narrowing our own humanity for it. So <laughs> hopefully this made sense. Yeah, thanks, Veronica. I, it's, it, I hadn't thought it yet about the idea that we tend to... Um, tend to want to then mimic this machine that we created, which I think is a very interesting dynamic. Um, and certainly problematic, as you mentioned. I also, I also was thinking that, uh, in, in regards to the terminology artificial intelligence, it kind of, if we back up and we think about where, you know, how we are calling, we've named this entity an artificial intelligent, it, it kind of implies that we humans have a kind of monopoly on what can be defined as intelligent and therefore have identified a certain kind of intelligence that is artificial, let's say subpar, let's say less than in some way or another, um, which I find highly, highly problematic because not only like do we not even understand, we, don't, we haven't even figured out how we think yet, much less other entities 
on, that we share the planet with that we haven't even included in, in entities that are capable in our, in, in the, let's say, prevailing ideas of being intelligent. But we're starting to see that, you know, trees have an incredible network, an incredibly intelligent network. Um, the idea of planetary intelligence is, is, is emerging. Um, uh, so, not, <laughs> we don't, just to say that we don't even understand our own intelligences yet, and, and we, do, we, we can't really communicate or, let's say, understand intelligences and, and networks and systems that are living with us at the moment, and for us to already then be um, labeling things as artificial is just wild to me. It, it makes no sense. Can I respond to that? Please, yes. Yeah. So um, what's interesting about it um, is that the cultures um, that are labeled as more primitive, um, that's obviously a derogatory term, as less advanced, namely indigenous cultures versus cultures anchored in settler coloniality, have an actually have had for, for centuries, for millennia, a more advanced way of thinking that is now being proven by bleeding edge scientific research. And that is namely that instead of projecting consciousness onto artificial entities, such as gods, demons, or aliens, people from many indigenous cultures, and I don't want to uniformize, but that is actually quite widespread across radically different indigenous cultures around the world, have always looked at other than human species, as well as even certain what we label as natural phenomena, an ocean, a mountain, a forest, as an intelligent entity. And as, again, not philosophically, not spiritually, not religiously, but through bleeding edge scientific research, that is proven to be true. And so again, there comes this paradox of the so-called modern enlightenment Baconian man, because again, most of these were men, being so deliberate in not wanting to see and analyze these intelligent systems, these conscious systems, but whose consciousness is quite unlike ours. And to consider that there's a whole lot to learn from other ways of processing and communicating the information that a system encounters, right? Because every living organism does process and communicate information that it encounters. All animals, even if they don't have something that would be labeled as human language, have communication systems because they do engage in complex social tasks. And I'll go even as far as to say that similar kind of attitude extends towards disabled people and neurodivergent people whose intelligence maybe superficially appears quite outside of the norm. And so what I'd like to invite <laughs> a lot of the people collected here um, in this room, as well as watching online, is to think, well, what could we learn if we could shift away from that model of seeing the world? And how, again, instead of seeing artificial intelligence and robotics and what we could do with it as these fictional entities and gods and demons, what we could learn and how we could design things better if we think of them and learn from other than human intelligences here on earth. And this is where I remember in our previous conversation, uh, we had this um, joke how so much of the chatbots today, despite their terrifying capacity to automate, truly, truly um, terrible impact kind of having AI disinformation warfare. 
But if we overlook that, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, these chatbots are more like a puppy that you've been training <laughs> to not piss on your carpet. And yet, when you gave it a prompt that it did not understand, it just did that again. And so in order to get the outcome that you want, instead of expecting the right response and some kind of Oracle solution from the first question, maybe what we need is more chat, right? And less bot. Maybe what we need is to learn better how to interact with a system, how to nudge it better than just expect it to figure out. In order to do that, we also need a much more active citizen engagement to push these companies to design better, not just for the some of us, the tiny fraction I spoke about earlier, but for the many of us. And that will actually make these systems better for majority of humanity. Monica, as we were reading your uh, profile information, actually one fascinating thing uh, came to my mind. Um, when we think about artificial intelligence tools that are being developed, mostly in Silicon Valley, uh, the starting point usually is technology-centric, right? People are trying to solve specific problems that are very practical and that are easy to monetize, easy to put to the market. Uh, then in Europe, when we talk with this, within this global geopolitical context, we say, well, Europe has this more human-centric approach, and then we want to b uh, bring in some, you know, human values because we have long traditions of human rights, and then, you know, f French Revolution, and we can go back. Uh, but then you have this amazing uh, concept of life-centric. So can you elaborate a little more? Uh, how do you understand uh, these newly evolving technologies? Within our conference, we are also eager to hear about, uh, you know, uh, technologies that augment our abilities. But can we weave in together uh, with the concept of life-centric? Yeah. Um, so I uh, recently had an honor to join a, a new collective, an all-African collective. So far, I'm the only non-African involved called African Life-Centric Design. So just a shout out to them. I think we're going to be doing some really, really interesting projects with it. And um, the reason why that project was started um, is, again, going back to the genesis of design approaches. We started with user-centric design, where we thought of humans simply as users. And then that approach got rightly criticized because it actually dealt with humans like another industry that thought of humans as users did, which is drug dealers, right? This notion that we just need to suck out and maximize the commercial value out of people and really not think of the person using any particular technological term in the long term and what it's actually giving to them. Then there was that movement towards human-centric design putting human in a center and really thinking of our sort of emotional needs and well-being, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still very much thought of human as an individual. But we are not individuals, you know. Unlike a lot of sort of libertarian discourse in the United States of America, as is exemplified, for example, with things such as Burning Man, um, where it is considered that, you know, I remember one of the years there was this, uh, at the end of a pamphlet, it said, only you are responsible for your own desires. That is a lot. Everything that we are is influenced by everything that we have been, seen, and experienced. In fact, here in South Africa, we have a term for it called Ubuntu. And it says, I am because we all are. We exist in this continuous web of interactions. And so that's where the appearance of humanity-centered design came in, taking into account a broader human society and how we all affect each other and how our well-being is interdependent. And that's, I'm going to correct you, Paul, in reading my bio, the term was actually not independent, but interdependent. And that's something I keep trying to hammer in, that the goal, the aspirational goal for everything that we design, and especially our planetary civilization, should not be independent 
because independence is a delusional idea. The truth is that we are all interdependent and not just as humans, but truly as all life. We know that about 40 trillion cells within our body are not even ours. That represents about 90% of DNA, 10% in overall mass approximately, but 90% of actually DNA diversity. And our microbiome in a way is called our second brain, and it is inseparable from who we are. And so we can be well, not just physically, but also psychologically and even intellectually, if we live in an environment that is well. In fact, there's no such thing as environment, because as we know ourselves, we're not even these walking islands, but an ecosystem tied together with other ecosystems. So this is where my call for life-centric design comes in, that whatever we design, be it artificial intelligence systems, or our cities, or even our home habitats, we have to start considering how we are designing it for all life. How does that integrate everything else that sustains life and hence sustains humanity? And how paradoxically to ensure long-term, not just human thriving, but even the bare survival, we sometimes need to descend to humans and descend to humanity. Not in such a way that, you know, we, we look forward to post-human futures or think of humans as the virus, not at all but actually because of the way humanity is intertwined with everything else that supports us. And so I think that is something really, really interesting to think about. And in order to do that, we have to observe more of how things are in this world rather than just project our own science fictions onto it. And so when that gets brought to artificial intelligence, we have to think of it not as some kind of magical thing that exists in the cloud, but as a real infrastructure with all of the rare earth minerals that it requires, with all of the water, with all of the fossil fuels, or even if we move away from fossil fuels, even the renewable energy takes a certain toll. And we cannot separate it and imagine it as something that stands apart from the rest of the planet. And in there, we have to think how instead of just expanding and expanding, and expanding the computational power to provide better and better in service, to actually think, and this is where I think African approach comes in. You know, on the African continent, people live, and even large corporations, because I've worked also with large corporations here, in a very different reality, because there isn't just like, a billion dollars sitting in a bank and you can just throw it at, throw it at whatever random project and see whatever sticks, then we keep that. We live in a kind of reality where every choice and whatever you fund means that you wouldn't fund something else. Whatever you extract means there will actually be a real experience toll of it. And so we have to become much more aware and intelligent about our choices and what actually is worth and what isn't worth. Thanks, Monica. Very, very interesting. Uh, it, it also, um, it, it make, I'm highly skeptical of, uh, of this idea that we use technology to further our own sort of cause of dominating nature further and further and further and putting ourselves always at the center um, of the conversation about the planet. Uh, and what I'm gathering from what you just said is that uh, it's an idea to have the, as we develop um, AI further, to have it be connected to other species, to other interests, to the interest of the planet in general, maybe the universe, I don't know, but to not have it be this yet another tool that humans use to, let's say, completely control our environment and the planet. Is, this is a bit what you're, what you're saying, yeah? 
hundred percent. I mean, it's it's about whatever we're building, um, technological, infrastructural, not being on top of the landscape, but truly integrated in the landscape and considering everything that exists within that landscape. And also, I think a really important thing um, is to ask ourselves a question, you know, are we trying to solve a problem? Are we trying to solve humanity? Are we trying to solve a problem? Are we trying to solve the very existence of life here on earth? Because unfortunately, so far as influenced by a lot of these cultural myths, and that's exemplified, for example, by a new emergent bundle of ideologies called Tescreal, um, transhumanism, extropianism, cosmism, singularitarianism, effective altruism. Um, these ideologies, they again project that God image and think of human life as something that is human life and the planet and, and the very soil as something that is temporary and hence dirty, filthy, and needs to be transcended in favor of the cosmos. And if that's not the new tech theological version of ascensionism, the very kind of old Christian ascensionism, where everything that is below is somehow, you know, bad, dirty, and evil, and everything that's above and everything that's in a cosmos is somehow heavenly, then I don't really know what is. And so, you know, we look at a lot of people that still live in the cultures where there's a lot of uh, uh, sort of religious prejudice um, in people's believing in, you know, witchcraft and sort of very narrow uh, sort of religious dogmas and stuff like that. And we think that somehow people living in this quote unquote modern societies are immune to that. But really, we are not. We're just projecting these new mythologies. You know, people that in a way lost their faith in God and sometimes left some of these sort of um, fundamentalist religions, find a new God or new theology through these technological means. And what it does, it makes us actually miss the very point of being alive here in this earth on this body, in this body. And so, I mean, my own thinking within that really was consolidated by my super early involvement in this uh, third wave of virtual reality. I got into it about 2012, 2013, before Oculus was being sold to, to Facebook. And what I was really disappointed back in the day and, and end up becoming a speaker to speak out partially about it, is this obsession with replacing our physical reality with a simulation. But the truth is that you cannot replace a walk in a forest with a simulation of a walk in a forest. Because when you walk in a forest, you engage with it, with your entire body. And, you know, even if you create an artificial wind and temperature change and you put some kind of essential oils, that will never be a good enough simulation. Because when you walk through a forest, right, you are inhaling all this bacteria and fungi. And when you touch that tree bark, some particles of it stay on your hand. And that tactile experience also has a very important impact, not just on your body, but on your mental experience of it all. And so instead of that, what I saw as an amazing opportunity is something that my friends back in the day did. It's a collective called Marshmallow Laser Feast. And what they did, instead of trying to simulate a walk in a forest through their virtual reality experience, they showed a hidden side of a forest, the invisible mycelial system under the soil, the way the trees inhale carbon and exhale oxygen. How do our breath interact with the way the trees breathe? And what it did instead of taking us out of the physical reality, it made us see the hidden layer of it, that when we go back into the forest, all of a sudden a whole new layer of understanding opens up to us about this complex ecosystem. And so you know, even today, what I'm thinking about, we are in this very dangerous era 
of everything becoming increasingly automated and pushing us, you know, now we're not within even social media filter bubbles, but soon enough, we're going to be create, we're going to be pushed within artificial intelligence, machine learning filter bubbles. Today, we still have, you know, voice assistants um, such as Cortana, Alexa, Siri that have that uniform personality. But the future of it is increasing customization to whoever is the person that is asking the questions. With that, if we just give people more of what they want, we'll silo them away further and further into that narrow cultural, social, political space that already they exist in. Now, my attitude towards social media and any kind of digital tools is very, very different. So I find a lot of other people that grew up in big metropolises that already had access to diverse communities, to um, amazing cultural institutions, et cetera, et cetera. I was born in a small town in North Lithuania called Shole. And there really wasn't much for me there. You know, I felt a bit alien as a kid within that environment. And so I latched myself onto these digital tools and found my first communities very much in the digital space. And because I always was somebody that was blessed and cursed with pathological curiosity, I dug into a lot of very strange and particular things that are not within a narrow silo. But it's true that not everybody's like that. So this notion that the only way for us to design, be it virtual reality experiences or artificial intelligence or any other technological tool is predetermined, is absolutely not true. The fact that it can only be bad is absolutely not true. The fact that it can only push us into a more narrow, narrow field that just kind of reduces our humanity is absolutely not true. But in order for that to change, we need to do what I always speak about. Give people, yes, everything that they hope for, but not what they expect. Challenge our understanding, challenge our, our imagination, and more importantly, above anything else, make us curious of this extraordinary world that we live in, of the complexity of our own bodies, of our own minds. And this is, this is my invitation at all times. Let's design things in such a way that do not isolate us further, but bring us together, not because of our similarities, but for our differences and invite the curiosity. Thanks, Monica, that's very interesting. Um, definitely makes us think about the ideas that not only sci-fi narratives have been driving the development and the conversations about uh, AI, but also more ancient narratives, and we just can't seem to um, rid ourselves of using these models as development for a technology. Um, and then the other thing that I, that I thought was interesting is that you talked about thinking about what we're automating, you know, automating the you talked about the, why are we trying to automate um, a walk in the forest? And it, I thought of a, a tweet that it was actually a tweet, not an X post, uh, that I read a couple years ago that said, so we have AI over here writing poetry and singing songs, and I have to go to work and dig ditches every day. What's, the, what's backwards here? <laughs> so, I mean, it's... It's so interesting to think about why, what we're tempted to want to automate and what, and what we should maybe save, save as, a, as a nice human experience. Um, that being said, uh, I think we want to open up the panel now for questions from the audience. How's that, Monica? Yeah? Are you game? Yeah, maybe I can, I can just add a little bit to, to what you said. Um, so, you know, when generative AI came out, um, there was a whole lot of discourse of, you know, how um, this is making artists obsolete um, and how terrible this is going to be for creativity. Um, and I think it was really decontextual. 
I think there were things that are really terrible and the things that are really terrible about it, such as, you know, stealing people's work and likeness um, without uh, correct attribution, without adequate payment for it, without adequate respect if people want to opt out of those systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, the truth is that, for example, in the field that I work in a lot, which is science fiction world design, things have been the same and derivative for a very long time. People have been going and looking at the same sort of brutalist sci-fi inspiration boards forever. And also the truth is that it takes an extraordinary amount of human hours to animate anything that is intricate and sort of more life evoking, biomimetic, um, natural shapes, rather than just sort of these simplified brutalist um, sort of polygon type of designs. And what excited me um, at that moment in time is finally starting to see in the realm of futures depiction, some organic matter, some integration of technological design and the living world, some integration of the future urban spaces and the living fabric of life. And I think that has been needed for a really, really long time. So again, even here, I think it's very important to not disregard the infringement on artists' rights or any kind of human data pillaging um, that is done in an inappropriate way or exploitative way. But at the same time, we also have to think how that as a tool is opening up new possibilities and new opportunities, not to just replace the existing artists and create more of the same stuff that we've been doing, but what kind of new things that allows for us to create. And so right now I'm, I'm working also on a collaborative piece with Adobe researcher Laura Herman um, in how generative AI could actually be used to but with a whole lot of human creativity and human input and human scientific research to allow us to prototype different future scenarios. So instead of trying to replicate civil rights era images through an engine that actually doesn't understand at all what it was like to live in that period of time, instead of trying to create the simulacra and replicas of the past or of the present day, can we instead start thinking, well, how could that, with again, a whole lot of human input and creativity, allow us to project and choose better alternative future scenarios? So we're curious if there are any questions from the audience. Yes, all right, uh, good. Martinez. Hello, Monica. Uh, Maybe a little bit provocative question, but it uh, seems that we already lost the monopoly for intelligence. I mean, natural intelligence or artificial intelligence, uh, it's almost equal now. Uh, in your view, what about the consciousness or someone in Gumas or someone, as we say it in Lithuanian? Will, uh, will consciousness be artificial in the future? Because in my view, it's very different from intelligence. And is it possible to have artificial consciousness? Uh, super interesting question. Thank you, Martinez. Um, well, we are still arguing actually what intelligence is and what consciousness is. And, you know, if, if um, and sometimes these things um, get overlapped um, or contrasted with each other. So it really depends on whose definition it is. Um, I personally, um, my take on it, uh, based on the best current literature um, in the field of um, biological sciences and neuroscience and cognition science, is that consciousness doesn't arise from mathematical calculations or analysis of, of, analysis of data. If it would, it would easily become a sort of self-perpetuating algorithm. Consciousness, as exemplified by human consciousness, but also animal consciousness. And there's so many forms of consciousness, like octopi consciousness, that we are really struggling to understand and have any grasp on because it's so unlike ours. It's sort of like alien consciousness here on Earth that evolved simultaneously to human consciousness. 
To our best understanding is that it arises from a very complex interaction, not just of what's happening within the gray matter within our skull, but the distributed brain as the full sort of nervous system within our second brain that is all of our microbiome that exists within this physical body that again, as we spoke, contains more non-human DNA than human DNA um, that interacts with all the other human bodies that interacts with all of the other non-human bodies that has all of these experiences that result um, in specific sort of chemical reactions, hormonal balances and balances, et cetera, et cetera, that to our best capacity right now, the idea of artificial consciousness is a science fiction trope. Now, nobody's an oracle and can tell what the future is really going to come to be. But I am finding it a little bit shocking how this myth continues to be perpetuated by some of the world's most prominent sort of what I call tech gazillionaires. And my explanation to that is that it's simply a hang up that they have because as boys, as teenagers, and again, most of them are boys, <laughs> um, that many of them never really fully grew up to be grown men. Uh, I mean, Musk is such a great example of that. Um, that's my personal judgment, but just saying um, that they never let go of that science fiction fantasy that they liked so much back in the day. And so in a way, they're trying to drag all the data to fit that fantasy, then actually analyze fully what is the bleeding edge arising in the field. And this is not exceptional. This has always been the case. People think of scientific research and technological development as something that is objective, but it truly has never ever been so. It has always been biased by specific cultural, um, social, political uh, priorities and values and goals at any given time. And so, it is that way today as well. And I think in a few decades to come, we'll look back at this time. Right now, we think of science, current scientific paradigm as know all um, and the current technological paradigm as the only way that things can be done. But it's only enough to read about the history of science. Um, you know, any, any example, I mean, I read a lot of, you know, history of different medical sciences. And when you think of people's understanding of, for example, cancer, in the early 20th century, you are truly horrified at the kind of procedures and treatments um, and, and considerations um, that were the dominant sort of most bleeding edge considerations at a given time. And so we keep evolving. So no understanding is finite. But again, to my best read of the actual scientific, not science fiction literature, is that consciousness is something that needs to not just exist within the body, but that body needs to exist within the context and in continuous interaction with other bodies in a complex, rich environment with multiplicity of other species. And this is also what questions a lot of these sort of sci-fi narratives of humans just going in these tin cans and colonizing the greater cosmos, because in some way, we know how it works with ISS, how it needs to be continuously replenished from Earth with everything, right? Like the, the, the food and, and all, of the, all of the things that sustain life in there. Um, and so, my, th my thought about it is that actually, if we remove ourselves from our evolution environment, can we even retain our humanity? Not just philosophically or spiritually, but on a most fundamental basic physical level too. Thank you, Monica. Fascinating. Um, the, the question of consciousness is really interesting. I'd, maybe after you can tell me, you, you seem to have an idea what the difference between intelligence and consciousness is. I'm talking to the audience member, Monica, so I'd love to hear about it because I don't, I don't have a good idea. Um, well, I think, I hope that this small discussion sort of added a different dimension. Do you have a question? 
So, oh, I hope that this, uh, this small talk added a different dimension to the, to the day. Um, you know, the, it's interesting to hear from such an interdisciplinary uh, group of, of, of academics and industry leaders and thinkers, and um, I, I, I found it fascinating. I'm really glad that you could join us, Monica. Um, and thanks, Paul. And I'm going to actually let Paul probably has some final, final wrap-ups, but thank you very much. I would like to say, Monica, you cannot see and you probably cannot feel and we cannot replicate what uh, is the audience in this room uh, or what is the ambience in this room, but I feel that uh, everyone is really elated and inspired and uh, obviously I think it's really fascinating to have you. We have so many thoughts to even think about for the next uh, year, and we hope to have you <laughs> in 12 months, again, joining us either live or even in person at this conference. So once again, uh, big thanks uh, for joining and uh, sharing your thoughts and vision. It's amazing. Thank you so much. If I can just leave um, some parting words. Um is um, do not listen to what, what Mark Andreessen says in his Techno Utopian Manifesto. You know, what he says is that you know, all of the naysayers, all the critics are the enemies of progress. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, to be critical, to believe that this is not the only way that things can be done, to believe that we can do better, that we can continuously learn and adjust not just our technological tools and infrastructures, but also our own mind as we keep learning more and keep being challenged, not just scientifically, but also socially, culturally, and politically. That for me is a definition of being positive, to believe that we can actually change things and do them better rather than just to resign to the only way that they have been done before is the most positive thing that you can do. So keep criticizing, keep questioning, but do not stop with what are you saying no to. Always look at what are you saying no to as a starting point to what you can enthusiastically, joyfully, excitedly, curiously say yes to because these shared yes visions is really what we so direly need today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. We'll have to click the red button soon. <laughs> Bye. today's gathering is actually a closing statement by Professor Kozuka, who generously actually made this event possible. I would like to personally thank him for, you know, collaboration and this amazing opportunity to be a part of his group. And I know that you have a very challenging task <laughs> uh, to summarize uh, or maybe share some of your takeaways about this day, uh, what you have learned personally, and uh, I also hope that all of us have uh, scratched much deeper below the surface and that we really have something exciting to, uh, to think about in the future. So, Kozuka Sensei, please. Yes, and a, a, to conclude today's event in a very short word, and a, it was a fruitful event. That is, I'm sure that no one does that. Well, uh, to elaborate it more, and a, a after uh, my modest talk, and a, in the first panel, uh, we listened to how personal AI are uh, already in use and will uh, be in a more uh, will be in use in a more broad uh, sense in the uh, in a more uh, larger uh, scope. 
and a, a there, uh, as opposed to say my rather simplistic uh, 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 insight or initial thoughts uh, in my presentation, uh, the, there was one a very important a point raised that is the the, the importance of data. So an a personal AI or avatar uh, might might appear uh, something like a virtual personality, but and it cannot uh, operate without any data. Uh, so and a, a between things and person, and a, this data has a very important a, a position. That is what we learned uh, in the first panel. Besides, of course, we learned that a personal AI is already a, or is going to be a used and in, in, the, in the court and then for education and a, a also uh, for and a, a other a healthcare in, and in other areas as well. And then and a, a, there was also a very important and a reference to the ecosystem a, that, and a, 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 that surrounds uh, the use and development of the personal AI and avatars or a technology in general, and a, a which is required uh, not only to uh, make better use of the technology and to uh, make better uh, development of the, 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 the use and learning and development of this technology. So and a, 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 I, I, I am a lawyer, I, I am a law professor, and a, but a legal person is only a kind of part of this a, a ecosystem. Uh, there must be a various a types of people engaged in it and a, a, a have better understanding and better in, input a, in it a, so that uh, personal AI will contribute to improve or enhance a, our life and a, the level of our, uh, richness of our life and a, a capability of human beings. And then in the second panel, we uh, focus more uh, on the legal aspects, uh, starting with the uh, legal personality. And I, I, well, I, I was rather, uh, rather, rather impressed that and, uh, no one talked about uh, the, the initiatives of the European Parliament uh, a few years ago about giving a legal personality to AI. And uh, apparently, that idea has been become obsolete and be kind of taken over by the more kind of regulatory approach of AI Act, uh, which the European Parliament, I understand, adopted a few days ago. Uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, we started uh, thinking about uh, legal personality and a, the relationship uh, of the, uh, the legal relationship concerning the data uh, and a, a also model and uh, the, the GPT, how, how can, can lawyers a, 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 a categorize it? It's a question uh, to be considered. But anyway, so and a, a those relationships be a, a, a demanding a further legal exploration. And then uh, we uh, listened to, uh, say, uh, 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 the, the development and use of uh, 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 the personal AI uh, viewed from the legal and regulatory uh, perspectives and uh, uh, the, the, the question about uh, how much and in what manner uh, regulation should be uh, introduced uh, with these technologies. Yes, and uh, uh, that is of course important and uh, 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 although uh, 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 today's uh, symposium started uh, with uh, consider thinking about the private law aspects, uh, that was done with intent and uh, uh, we can say talk uh, uh, 
hours and hours about uh, the, uh, the, the EU AI Act and also the, DGP, the impact of GDPR or something like that. Uh, but and, uh, we, even if we started and, uh, talking about the private law aspect, still this kind of regulatory framework uh, cannot be separated. Uh, that is uh, what the, uh, the important uh, a, a, a point made uh, during that and a, a, a panel. And finally, uh, finally, uh, we had the pleasure of, a, 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 of a listening to uh, Monica, and, uh, and a, who is a fu futurist, and a, a gave us very and a, a, a various a, a, a food for thought and very inspiring and a, a, a statements. And a, 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 well, I personally speaking, uh, when I uh, talked about my uh, uh, modest opening uh, 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 talk, uh, the point that I was most uh, kind of concerned about is whether uh, the concept of individualism and the criticism of the modern individualism uh, was accepted by uh, you. Uh, apparently, uh, here uh, here is part of Europe where the, this modern thought uh, uh, originated from. Uh, but I was rather impressed that on the one hand, and uh, 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 Monica uh, mentioned uh, the, the, the engagement with the nature and reference to the, uh, th the approach of Ubuntu, uh, which is very local to uh, Africa, and uh, uh, emphasizing uh, not only, the, uh, not, not uh, on the absolute and a, a existence of human being vis-a-vis -vis the nature, but rather uh, inter interconnection uh, with the environment, including nature and society. So that was very uh, impressive. And more uh, impressed actually was that and a, a, in the second a, a panel, uh, the, 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 the the fintech investor, and a, a, who is, which is kind of the, the, the cutting the edge, a modernization uh, of technology, and a, a bad, and a, 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 a talked uh, that and a, a, when using various types of and a, 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 a social network uh, like Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, Instagram. And <laughs> a, a, a personality, a different personalities are used, uh, which seems to be that and a, a, the, the modern concept of a coherent individual is actually and a, a kind of a fictitious and a theoretical. A, a, that doesn't, doesn't mean that uh, the importance of this a, a concept uh, of individualism is uh, to be under-evaluated. Uh, that's not my intention, but rather uh, it, 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 we need to recognize that this is kind of a theoretical fiction uh, on which the, the society is based. And so as the technology develops and as we face new uh, a, a stages, a, a we need to always reconsider and recast and a new light on this very basic concepts. That is a, 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 what we, I think we learned uh, during this half day, very fruitful and very inspiring uh, symposium. And a, a, the last word of mine is, of course, an a, a to thank uh, the Vilnius University, its law faculty, and last but not least, a definitely to Paul, uh, Paul and for organizing this wonderful uh, occasion to uh, learn so much about this subject and to give a, a, all of us and a, 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 a food for thought and to the explore uh, on this very ambitious project. So I really thank Paul for this occasion and a, 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 that a, 
I think with that, I'd like to conclude uh, today's uh, conference, a, a title, Living with Personal AI Agents, which I think uh, it, it gave us a better uh, perspective about our future. So thank you very much for your participation, and let us uh, keep uh, studying, and let us have another occasion to uh, uh, communicate. Thank you very much. So we have one more announcement. The program says we have networking session. So if you want to stay around and chat and talk, uh, you know, we, we're happy to be here, spend some time. We have this room booked until 8 p.m. Hopefully we'll, we will not need it <laughs> until 8. Okay, thank you so much and then enjoy the evening. Happy weekend and thanks. Thank you.